morning. Good morning, my friends. Uh, you're awake, yeah. So it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to this Today, um, and some of them are also participating uh, virtually. Um, a very warm welcome to you all. I also recognize the uh, uh, presence of uh, senior government officials and representatives who are uh, with us today uh, from. UMC. Um, just um, request everyone to have on standing so that we can just offer a word of prayer. Just pray, Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this morning. We thank you for the source of life that you have provided to us. We thank you for all the uh, leaders as well as officials coming all the way from the seats, uh, member states to be here this morning. And these uh, three days of discussions, Lord, you will provide them wisdom, understanding, knowledge, courage, and strength, and also this in mind to discuss issues of importance for this uh, group, Lord. We thank you for blessing each and every one of them, and also the rest of this meeting. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, DG. Um, Now, in front of you, uh, you will find uh, copies of uh, uh, the meeting program. You will also find a notepad and a funny-looking pen. <laughs> and for those of you who have traveled, uh, uh, traveled to attend this meeting, you will have in front of you a, a very modest gift from the Vanuatu government, uh, which is a token of our appreciation for traveling to our shores to attend this meeting. The values of this gift are within the threshold allowable, allowable for UN officials. So you can all accept them. And the contents uh, of the gifts, as I say, the very modest, are all Vanuatu made products. None of them are made overseas. All of them 100% made in Vanuatu. 
now, without further ado, uh, we will now hear the opening address by the Under Secretary General of the High, uh, at the same time, High Representative of the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Countries, and Small Island Developing States, Her Excellency, Ms. Rahab uh, Fatima. Um, please play the video.
Board of Trade and International Cooperation in External Trade, the Honorable Masai Jeremiah Nawalo to deliver his keynote address. Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, MC. The Under Secretary General and High Representative of these developed countries, local land developing countries, and small island developing states, Her Excellency Ms. Fatima Rabab, the head of SCAP, Sub Regional Office for the Pacific, Ms. Andy Fong Toy, Excellencies, High Commissioners, Ambassadors, and Embassy staff, Senior UN officials, SIDS, National Focal Points, and Government representatives, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and warm greetings to you all of you who are joining us today, both in person and virtually, as we gather for the fifth Small Island Developing States National Focal Points Network meeting. On behalf of the government and the people of the Republic of Vanuatu, I have the distinct pleasure of warmly welcoming you all to our beautiful Pacific nation. At the outset, allow me to thank Madam Undersecretary General Rabab for her opening remarks. I wish also to thank OHRLLS for choosing Vanuatu as host of the first SEEDS National Focal Point Network meeting after the adoption of the Antigua and Barbuda agenda for SEEDS. We realized that the honor of hosting the meeting could have gone to other SEEDS member states. I also wish to thank SEEDS for agreeing to have this meeting hosted in our humble shores. Distinguished participants, your presence here is a continuation from the fourth International Conference of SEEDS held in Antigua and Barbuda in May of 2024, where SEEDS leaders engaged in extensive dis discussions to support SEEDS and address their unique challenges. A key outcome of the conference was the adoption of ABAS. The ABAS is a new 10-year action plan that builds upon the concluded Samoa pathway. It represents a renewed commitment to addressing the unique vulnerabilities of seeds where, while harnessing their potential and sustainable development. Key features of this new agenda include increasing development, finance effectiveness, climate resilience, and sustainable finance, the establishment of a SEEDS Global Data Hub, strengthening partnerships between SEEDS and the international communities and developing and monitoring and evaluation framework for ABAS to measure and report on the progress of its implementation. As small island developing states, we are aware of the many challenges we face in pursuing our development aspirations. And yet, despite these challenges, SEEDS have shown remarkable ownership leadership, resilience, and drive in pursuit of our respectable, respective sustainable development objectives. There is also strength in shared knowledge, building meaningful partnerships, and fostering cooperation between our different seeds subregions. For us to meaningfully combat these challenges and ensure that our commitment and goals within the ABAS can be met through actionable responsibilities at the national sub national as well as community and household levels in all our countries, we must recognize the critical role that SEED's national focal points play in these processes. The SEED's national focal points network was created to strengthen coherence and coordination of SEED's related sustainable development issues at national, regional, and global levels. Therefore, this year's fifth gathering of SEED's NFPs with a theme of coherent implementation of the Antigua and Barbuda Agenda for Small Island Developing States through strengthening the role of SEED's national focal points is a fitting one. We value the importance of the role that SEED NFPs play for our states and our people. We look forward to supporting you as you build and work through strengthening partnerships, as you share knowledge and best practices through integrated and multi-stakeholders approach. Distinguished participants, in particular the national focal points, over the next two days, I urge you all to make the most of this meeting, learn as much as you can, and return to respective homes, empowered and invigorated. 
you will be unpacking ABBA's, including having discussions around ABBA's focus areas. You will dictate, you will dedicate a session on how to integrate the ABBA's into the national frameworks, highlighting the important role of an m and &E framework to ensure its successful implementation. And last but certainly not the least, you will focus your meeting on strength, strengthening NFP partnerships. While engaged in these focused areas, we need to also think about how UN mechanisms and official development assistance can be remodeled to effectively support SEEDS in the next 10 years. We must also reflect on how we can address the issue of debt distress that most of SEEDS are facing amidst the, the climate emergency and geopolitical tensions. I would like to wish you all a very productive and successful meeting this week. I understand that on Wednesday, you will have the opportunity to visit the 83 Island Distillery and enjoy, enjoy Athens Blue Lagoon. I hope you can make time to enjoy whatever else Port Vila and Efate has to offer before returning to your respective homes, in particular to try our world famous organic beef and of course our Vanuatu kava. Lastly, please allow me to acknowledge the efforts of the OHR LLS team led by Ms. Tishka Francis and the Vanuatu and the Vanuatu Preparations Committee led by Ms. Juliet Hakwa to arrange this meeting. We appreciate the hard work put into making this meeting possible. I take the opportunity once again to welcome you to Vanuatu and wish you an enjoyable time here with us. I thank you, merci beaucoup, and thank you to us. Okay, thank you, uh, Honorable BPM, for your keynote address. Uh, if you are already, uh, if you're not already energized by the remarks by uh, Her Excellency Ms. Fatima and the Honorable DPM of Vanuatu, either your firewood is wet or you really are jet lagged, uh, or it could be both. Um, I now wish to invite all of us to um, gather outside for a very, very quick SITS family photo shoot. And uh, after the photo shoot, please quickly grab something, uh, a bite or a drink, coffee or a tea, and then head back straight into the conference room to start our first session. Um, please slowly, discreetly make your way outside for a quick photo shoot. Thank you. Our first session will be moderated by the head of SCAP sub-regional office, Ms. Sandy Fong-Toy. And she will, I will pass the mic to her to introduce the session and also to introduce the um, presenters and the lead discussants. And if I'm sorry, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Linda, and thank you very much, everybody, for coming back uh, so early for more seats. And I think my intention is we don't come back till 8 30, so I'm very stressed. Um, but that will ensure that we have the time for discussion. Um, so as the said, my name is Andy Montoy. I'm the head of the SCAP uh, sub-regional office of the Pacific Basin of Tourism. And it's a real pleasure uh, to be here at this meeting, uh, and in particular to welcome those of you who are not from the Pacific. Um, so uh, in this session, we will explore our sense of objectives, why must we forget the domestic business and the SDGs, and how six national focal points can harmonize the efforts uh, in implementation. Um, we will also touch uh, on uh, how we can also implement effective use of crops in different regions uh, and on integrated planning and implementation strategies using the best practices from the sample pathway of this diet. Uh, during this session, uh, we will hear from uh, national focal points as they share the lessons learned from their work in localizing the sound more pathway. And finally, we'll begin exploring potential partnerships and collaborations that can help drive the successful implementation of ABBAS. And it's really great to see, I think, uh, our development partners uh, in uh, a large number this morning. So let me uh, start by introducing uh, our esteemed uh, presenters. Uh, so, uh, for this session, uh, we will kick off with uh, uh, Ambassador Gutierrez, Ambassador Samoa uh, to the UN and Chair of Aerosis, and I'm sure all of us in this room know uh, Ambassador Gutierrez very well. 
We also have Ms. Louisa White, the Deputy President Representative of Barbados to the UN, and an and, and AOC Bureau member, and of course, uh, Mr. Francis, head of the Civil uh, Program uh, at UN OHR. So, just uh, before I get to talk to the presenters, uh, just to let you know that our presenters will have about seven to ten minutes for their presentation, uh, and then we will open the floor for our interactive discussion. Uh, so, if you first get the floor, uh, the best is very important. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Just to uh, say that uh, basically I'm here in my role as the chair of the Alliance of the United States. And therefore, it's of critical importance to us that the issue of implementation of Africa should be at the forefront. But I'm also uh, representing my country, but not a national focal point. So just to make that clear. I'm gonna, my presentation is gonna be uh, three levels. Firstly, the context. Second, is how we can harmonize implementation um, and the various global processes that are important for us to ensure that we implement the address in those uh, process. And then finally, uh, your role as uh, national focal point in the uh, implementation uh, process, as well as in the uh, monitoring and evaluation project. So those are the three main part of my presentation and I'll go over it very quickly. I have to say that firstly, the issue of APAS, we all, it's, it's ours. We own that process. And what I mean by that is the outcome document on civil power came out of three regional seminars that were held in each of our three sub-regions. And then we came together in a couple of work in the inter-region. And therefore, we put all of those together. So what happened is the process of going from regional to uh, basically all six levels. And therefore, we had to zero car. That was then subjected uh, to the G77 and China process. So we're going to 39 countries to 79, sorry, 78 plus uh, China. And I think that is the process, the documentary process was then the next phase in that. The only thing I want to say at this stage is that going through those processes, uh, we had our ambition. But as all of you are aware, negotiation is about compromise. And that is what happened within the UN process. So we never got everything we wanted. Uh, and I will, as I go through my presentation, uh, I will perhaps touch on some of the issues that we have to uh, face in terms of the challenges. So that is the process that therefore we went to uh, Antigua, and that's where our leaders endorsed the efforts. So we've gone through the official process. Now I want to just very quickly go through what is contained in the document. Firstly, chapter one. Chapter one speaks to primarily our experience where we have been from the Barbados to Mauritius to Samoa and then to Antigua and Barbuda. So that is captured in chapter one, but also our special circumstances, which is critically important in the context of small island state. Chapter two, then, is about aspiration, our aspiration. Um, and when you go through it, there are four main areas, and you can go through those. I'm not going to go over that because uh, we do not have the time. But what was, was interesting was that when we went through the negotiation process uh, at the event, 
they were another transmission that was telling us what our aspiration should be, what our priority should be. And we found them very uh, interesting and strange that other people know more about what we should aspire to than ourselves. So aspiration is chapter two. Chapter three is primarily the vehicle of how we get to where we want to be. And there are 11, sorry, 10 actually plus uh, in that chapter. And that's the most important one because I think this is really the chapter where our partners contribution are extremely important because they will say to us, yes, if you want this particular aspiration to be realized, this is what we can do. This is how we can help. And therefore, that is an extremely important chapter because it deals with action. And that is something that we deliberately decided at the start of the program. financial institution and also have the world banks, the private sector, and civil society are also critical in this process as we see. And then finally, chapter five is about the monitoring and evaluation uh, uh, framework, which uh, towards the end, I think you have an extremely important role to play uh, in that process. Moving on to the second part of my presentation, and this is the harmonization of the implementation of APAS and the global processes. I think what we need to realize is that the endorsement and approval of APAS is the first step. The most important step is its implementation, and we are already five months out since the endorsement in Antigua and Rapunzel. By next year, we will only have nine years left. I want to raise those points because I want to highlight the critical importance of implementation and ensure that we minimize the gap between Antigua and Rapunzel and the start of implementation of efforts. Because the longer we have it, the longer they are, the less effective we will be in terms of the implementation uh, process. So I think we, we really do need uh, to keep that uh, in mind. So how do we avoid then uh, widening the gaps in implementation uh, from our other program of action that I already mentioned uh, earlier on? The, uh, Barbados plan of action, the emergency strategies, the summer pathways, and now we have uh, the anti uh, uh APAS. Firstly, I think we, uh, we need to agree uh, on the level of action and partnership that can truly charge uh, a cause for resilient prosperity to all our communities. And I emphasize the, the phrase uh, resilient uh, prosperity because some of you, as you will recall, that is was the theme of the uh, Antigua and Barbuda uh, conference. Secondly, I think we need to sustain a uh, partnership that underpins international cooperation. Uh, I think one of the big lessons that we've learned from the last 30 years is that working in silence is not the way to go. It, it, because our problems are all interconnected. And therefore, if you work in silence, 
by the Muslim community, uh, we will not be uh, as effective. Uh, and this is where I refer to uh, partnership, whether they are with our donors, with the private sectors, with our youth, uh, with civil society, all of them are important. But the challenge for us here is to ensure that we harmonize and coordinate our partnership and implementation. We don't want to just focus on, for example, uh, the private sector, the UN development system, for example, and make critical, or just our partners. I think we need to look at all of this and agree on how we can also avoid the implication of action. And in this, uh, in, in this part, uh, for example, with uh, our partners, I've already started the process uh with the european union for example uh we would be meeting with all the 27 ambassadors of uh, the european union next month with all the ambassadors of EOSIS to see how the european union as a group can help in the implementation of others but we're not going to stop there we will also be talking with our partners like the uk uh, the US, uh, Australia, New Zealand, for example, they are all critical uh, to the process. So let's uh, look at those. The other uh, issue I want to raise under this uh, heading is the operationalization of the center of excellence. I think some of you have heard of this. There are primarily four main areas which we need to focus. Uh, First, the issue of health sustainability. Uh, secondly, the issue of data, which is a huge challenge in all of the countries. Thirdly, technology and innovation. And then finally, the issue of investment. And then on the first, the data and investment, just to uh, connect this with another initiative of small island development state, as uh, you probably realize. And that is the issue of the multi-dimensional vulnerability index. I think that has been mentioned, and I think, okay, that is something that we cannot uh, allow uh, to go on the wayside. I think we all need to continue in our advocacy and ensuring that that is implemented uh, as soon as possible. And then, uh, Finally, on the harmonization of implementation, uh, we do integrate uh, address into the various uh, processes at the international level, as well as ongoing uh, agreements and framework. So, for example, the uh, Pact of the Future, uh, some of you will will be aware that uh, EOSIS had to fight very hard to ensure that a lot of our issues are included. If you look at the future, there are five main thematic areas, uh, and they all include uh, issues that are important uh, to us. So we need to take out some more. Uh, COP29, in terms of financing, uh, some of you will be aware that we need to fight that matter in terms of financing, especially for climate change. So the new collective fund uh, goal for climate finance, that is a critically important issue for us. And we need to be there. Uh, and we have uh, coordinated meetings uh, up to uh, COP29. So your support in that area is also uh, important. We also have the Sendai framework, uh, as well as financing for development, uh, which will take place uh, next year. So all those are important, and we will need to continue uh, to advocate uh, for our issues to be included. And then finally, your role uh, in terms of uh, these various uh, processes. Um, I think the first point I want to uh, raise with you is the, the implementation 
of Abbas must be aligned with sense, context, and priorities. I think this is extremely important uh, and as national point, I think you're well placed uh, to mature uh, as the, the case. And I think uh, avoid uh, duplication, uh, you know, with other existing processes is also very important. Uh, this is where you can play a, an invaluable and pivotal role by ensuring that others is closely aligned with your national priorities, suitable to local context and harmonies with national, regional, and international process. May I uh, be bold enough to suggest that uh, as a national football point, uh, you will be the champions of Abbas because you are uh, very much well positioned in the local context. And that is, at the end of the day, it's about implementation on the ground. There's nothing more important than that. Many of you will also be instrumental in overseeing the monitoring and evaluation framework. So I think that's the second goal that I see, uh, and that is to ensure that we uh, measure and the process for measuring uh, progress is meaningful and reflects tangible process on the ground. Again, emphasizing action on the ground, because that's really what it is. And that is really the key in terms of all of this, is implementation uh, on the ground. You will be integral uh, to also the assignment of the uh, interagency task force. Uh, this is the task force that is leading the process on the MNE uh, framework. So I see a critical role for you in terms of your uh, link and uh, perhaps uh, working with uh, that particular uh, task force. In closing, as important players in the implementation process, I take the uh, opportunity to thank you all for your active uh, engagement and commitment to advance the implementation of APRES within your respective uh, countries uh, and region. I, I look forward to uh, your reflection on how we can work together to galvanize action that will bring about the necessary transformative changes that our people have been missing for themselves and for our city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Terry, for your very insightful and comprehensive uh, presentation, reminding us that now that uh, you know we have an other framework, it is all about implementation, and especially the contextualization. Uh, of implementation and the importance of activity uh, on the ground. Uh, so now uh, it's my pleasure uh, to turn to our second presenter, uh, Ms. Berita White, and we have the floor. Thank you so much. Good morning to colleagues. Good morning to um, persons here. And thank you to Van Watu for the wonderful hospitality um, that you've displayed so far. Coming after Ambassador Nutero, um, as well as Obviously, the open chair. I, I really don't know what more there is for me to say, but I might attempt to, to say it. Um, so, uh, the topic this morning is unpacking a bus. Um, so, I'll just walk you through the slide that we have here. Um, so, what I will attempt to do, I'll um, just set up four points. Um, the first will be the introduction and context of a bus. Um, then, we'll move to key objectives and goals of a bus. Um, and then Abbas as a distinct framework within global alignment. And then the fourth point will be support and enabling mechanisms for implementation. So moving then to the introduction, 
As the ambassador said before, the Antigua and Barbuda agenda for SIDS, the ABAS, was adopted this year during the SIDS War Conference uh, in May. And it builds on the legacies before it. These include the Barbados Program of Action, the POA, the Mauritius Strategy of Implementation, the MSI, and the Samoa Pathway. ABAS provides a comprehensive 10 year roadmap. It responds to challenges which didn't exist or have worsened since uh, Samoa was adopted in 2014. The ABAS is aligned with global frameworks such as the 23rd Agenda, the Paris Agreement, and the Sendai Framework. The ABAS focuses on key areas such as, not such as, but definitely not limited to, economic resilience climate action, biodiversity, innovation, and health, all of which position SIDS to achieve a sustainable and resilient future through strong international partnerships and support mechanisms. We'll then look at the importance of SIDS for and ABAS. Um, it continues to hold a space for SIDS. This is what ABAS does. And it's critical at a time, and I believe that the ambassador mentioned this, when so many, particularly within the UN negotiations in New York, COP negotiations, and even MFD negotiations are questioning um, the special circumstances of SIDS and encroaching on these um, special circumstances. ABAS continues the recognition first made at the Earth Summit in 1992 for the special case of SIDS. And it updates the action plan to current to reflect current realities and provide tailored solutions to SIDS and pressing issues. Moving on then to the objectives and goals of the VAS. Um, as mentioned, we look at economic resilience, scaling up climate and biodiversity efforts, as well as disaster risk reduction. So as relates to economic resilience, the VAS aims to diversify SIDS economies beyond tourism and imports by focusing on innovative, driven sectors such as renewable energy, digital transformation, and the new economy, which will lead to long-term resilience. As it relates to climate and biodiversity efforts, the vast renews commitment to scaling up climate and adaptation and mitigation efforts, focusing on nature-based solutions, ocean resources, and marine biodiversity. As it relates to DRR, disaster risk reduction, the ABAS integrates disaster risk management into international policies to reduce the disproportionate impact of natural disasters on SIDS. This includes investment in resilient infrastructure and early warning systems. Additionally, health and social protection. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic exposed weaknesses in healthcare and social safety nets. The ABAS aims to build more robust systems to protect communities from future crises. And also innovation and technology, the ABAS establishes the innovation and technology mechanism that is key for driving digital transformation and climate tech innovations that support sustainable development across states. We now look at VAS as a distinct framework. So the VAS is in alignment with global frameworks that I mentioned before. It complements international frameworks like the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Agreement, Sendai Framework, and it ensures that SIDS are fully integrated into global efforts to combat climate change and promote sustainable development. It also prioritizes global commitments while ensuring that SIDS are not left behind. It continues to maximize resources and efficiency, aligning the ABAS with existing frameworks, allows it to leverage global resources. It also streamlines implementation by avoiding duplication of efforts and optimizing limited resources. It gives a distinct focus on SIDS needs. Uh, as mentioned before, it offers a localized, tailored approach for SIDS 
um, our summit say for us, by us, for you, and focuses on immediate and long-term um, vulnerabilities. We move then to support and enabling factors for implementation. At the international level, we have debt sustainability support as well as climate finance. There's also the global data hub. And then we have at the regional level, since its cooperation and things such as this is the international focal point. So in conclusion and to wrap up, our progress in, in advancing sustainable development goals is evident through the measurable impact of strategic collaboration and innovative approaches. We see the ABAS as a roadmap for SIDS resilient future. It provides a clear strategic framework to address the unique vulnerabilities of SIDS in today's context. It gives alignment with global frameworks. It aligns with the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Agreement, and Sendai Framework, and ensures that global goals are adopted to are adopted or adapted to SIDS local needs. And it's also a call for collective action. It is a shared path towards resilience and sustainability, requiring strong partnerships and localizing efforts for a prosperous future for SIDS, where no one and no island is left behind. I thank you. Um, and just before handing over then to um, back to the moderator, and just to say as we continue then this discussion this morning, we'll delve deeper into what it is that you as national focal points can do um, and such things like that. So thank you once again for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. White. Well, I'm thanking uh, that I was with the people did for us. So now it's my uh, pleasure to uh, hand over the floor uh, to Jessica for your comments. Thank you, Andy, and uh, Excellency colleagues. Uh, good morning. Uh, as I am the last to speak on this particular panel, but, um, I am aware that there may be some overlap um, in the discussion, um, but some of it bears repeating, and uh, others um, bears a, a little bit more um, in-depth discussion. So I will start my presentation, and forgive me, I have multiple paths, with um, a bit of setting the scene and attacking the ABAS, uh, building on the presentation that the bit before me. So the, the presentation will first be outlined the components of the ABAC, which we won't need to go into uh, much detail on. Thank you, Teresa, for going into that and its tangible deliverable. And subsequently, I will discuss the alignment of the ABAC to international, regional, and national framework, and which is critical for harmonized implementation. And then finally, I will reflect on drivers and challenges in maintaining the ABAC at the national level. So the Antigua and Barbuda agenda for SIDS the ABAS, um, we, we know that it was formally adopted at the fourth conference, fourth international conference of SIDS in May in Antigua and Barbuda, and it outlines SIDS development priorities for the next 10 years. And of course, it builds on, as we said, the previous blueprint uh, for SIDS sustainable development, some more pathway, commercial strategy for further communication, the way and the way itself. Just to note here that uh, the ABAS enjoys the full endorsement of member states, all of the member states of the United Nations, and its adoption signifies the international community's collective ambition to support the city. And I won't go into much detail here because um, many, much of this was said before. Um, so, but just to remind that the ABAS controls in three main chapters. As, as was said before, and that it also includes the section on the role of the UN and on the Ebony framework, which we all uh, agree is a very important piece in the implementation. So, uh, 
here again, we go into some of the um, focus areas of the ABA and uh, uh, many of the, uh, the issues were already raised by my previous, uh, by the previous speakers. But I just wanted to touch on a few key priorities um, because they all speak to um, how we will address uh, ABA implementation in particular uh, with respect to international other international framework. Uh, so some of them include the reform of international architecture when it comes to economic resilience, supporting debt sustainability, and uh, mainstreaming the MPI and the multi-dimensional vulnerability index into relevant policies and practices. And this is particularly important as we move to uh, adopt the MPI within the UN system and also advocate for it for use with national institutions and uh, the multilateral development bank and beyond. Uh, we also want to speak to um, supporting the island connectivity, which I don't think was uh, touched on uh, previously, and linking the city to regional and global markets at the critical importance to economic diversification as well. Expanding city productive capacity, as well as advancing resilient and sustainable tourism. Those are some of the key uh, uh, priorities under economic resilience. We also have a focus, as was said, on equal cool inclusive and productive population, climate action, disaster risk reduction. And I won't go into the details again here. They are all in the last for your further reading. Um, if you haven't already, some of us are well familiar with the details of the other. But again, the priorities around health and society, including biodiversity, science, technology, innovation, digitalization, we will speak on uh, some sessions tomorrow, and of course, partnerships, uh, which is a very key point in carrying the uh, of us agenda forward. So, now I will move on to some of the more tangible outcomes of that because these are, have um, been touched on already as, as well. Um, the SID Center of Excellence, which includes the SID's data hub, the technology and innovation mechanism, the Island Investment Forum, and the SID's debt sustainability support service. I believe it's now being coined as uh, SID's debt Q or uh, since that SQ or something of that, 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 that remains same. So we will hear more about these initiatives tomorrow. We have a focal point here from that teacher talk to the whole year to expect to go into more detail to that. So uh, with respect to the monitoring and evaluation framework, we will also have a session on that. Uh, my last of this one, so we will go into more detail there as well. But paragraph 38 of that, that means to develop a monitoring and evaluation framework with player target indicators to be completed by no later than the second quarter of 2025. And this work, as was mentioned by the past, that will be guided by an interagency task force. Uh, we have begun the work of the uh, interagency task force on its first meeting uh, last month. And we will go into more detail, as I said, in the coming session. But the critical to the MA framework is that it's nationally owned and consultative and aligned with existing reporting mechanisms to avoid duplication. Our data will be collected in collaboration between SIDS and national statistical offices and the UN Regional Commission. And the NSPs will play a key role in ensuring that the MA framework is being developed in line to the SIDS context. Going more into the line of the international frameworks. So, the, as, as was mentioned, you know, the objectives of the ABAS are closely, closely aligned to key international, regional, and national development frameworks. And this alignment will be explored in the coming slides with a view to providing a basis for our consideration on how best to mainstream the ABAS, harmonize implementation efforts, and ensure coherence at all levels. And it should be noted that the framework.
Webster's also considers the uh, framework of the regional level as well as the UI mainstream in the IMS and comparing the implementation strategies and the use of regional um, frameworks include the 2015 Blue Pacific Strategy, CARICOMS, and PICIT. But again, this is not meant to be. It's not meant to be exhaustive, but it's then provide a basis for our discussion. So please, if you have any further feedback on these, uh, we are very um, happy to hear those and include those in our discussion and further work. Thank you very much. Thank you also thank you for the uh, the whole you know the, the three speakers that have kind of set up um, our discussions up very nicely. Uh, so we actually have quite a, a generous amount of time uh, for our discussions until we bring uh, morning tea uh, at eleven thirty. Um, but if the, I think the end, I think it's the pound page just a lot. But I think just this last slide was really useful in terms of our discussions. Uh, and 
I think one of the things also that we're going to invite tomorrow is certain actions that are undertaken at the regional level as opposed to national level. I think that's where the subsidiarity actually comes in. And, and just to uh, let you know, because I think that's time that particular question. In the context of uh, European Union, a
So that will already be three or will be three two. But the challenge, of course, is to ensure that that does not mean that those resources will not be replenished. They will have to be replenished. But what we are trying to do is to fast track implementation because resources that will
the graduation at the national level and how monitoring at the regional level can also trigger some of these processes moving forward. So we're going to look at those links um, and integrate them in the best possible way to ensure that we can identify with the shortfall so that we can then focus attention on those where the connection is more uh, in terms of whether it's financial assistance. Um, because I think as we move along, we need to do that, otherwise we won't be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Um, thank you. Just to, to reiterate and reemphasize the point then, um, that the ambassador made, uh, as we talk about monitoring and evaluation, that was something that we go into more detail uh, in the second session this afternoon. Um, just to talk about how partners and perhaps help us if we think about this. So, mentioned in one of my slides, and so if I ask her the tour. When we're talking about um, the establishment of the global data hub uh, that the Abbas calls for um, to enhance decision making by providing sits with accurate and accessible data for better tracking um, of kind of infant resilience, et cetera. So this is something then that we would welcome um, assistance in building out um, this data hub because even if we're talking about monitoring and evaluation with nice fish and the team for getting the interagency task force up and running. Um, to to have it without actually having the data then to to plug in or to find out what you're doing is something that would definitely be needed. So so we think about partners um, and partnering for that. Um, and then also as it relates to since its cooperation, um, something then that was mentioned that we'll talk about later is the DSSI um, or DQ or DQ. I will hear remember the new name about now um, that was talked about um, that was spearheaded by Antonio Margarita in the Abbas. Um, a four pounds approach to, to dealing with debt, et cetera. Um, and also in terms of citizens cooperation, think of the citizens blue green um, knowledge transfer hub um, that's also being partnered um, with UNIDO um, and University of West Indies. Also then looks at um, building building a hub to, to access for citizen access information and then learn best practices. Um, so just wanting to like those things and then look forward to delving in deeper in the next sections. Thank you. Richard. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rich Thomas, and I'm from Lao. And I just wanted to thank the um, DPR for bringing up the, the data hub. And uh, just to echo what our colleague from Trinidad and Tobago think that uh, there are already things that we can build up on and, and make sure that we're not duplicating our effort. And then I just wanted to mention that we in the Pacific, we do have a Pacific data hub. Um, and also um, at the SDF uh, level, I'm sure any of you are familiar with the um, with the uh, sort of country tailored uh, uh, dashboards that were recently developed for for the uh, SDF country. And we were doing um, uh, like a number of consultations uh, earlier this year to to um, to populate those dashboards. And I just want to mention that um, perhaps that these are sort of existing uh, like mechanisms that we can work with rather than sort of starting from scratch and, and really ensuring how those uh, are um, can complement the, the the global data that I have been done. Correct name for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mata. I want to take away the the, the next session on data, but just to say that um, 
and specifically we held out the form of sustainable development on Tuesday and Wednesday last week. And in this session, we had focused on the, you know, the four SDGs and the partnerships that will be the focus of the high level forum in July next year in New York. Every session that they, they highlight on that. Uh, and so we, as a specific office, we're going to go back to the drawing board and have a look at the try and access. Because um, as we there, there is technical assistance, there's, uh, you know, there is data available, there's many surveys, but somehow in the Pacific, we are not shifting the data. Uh, and I think maybe we are coming in at the level that, you know, maybe our members are not fine enough, but somehow we're just not hitting the nail, like put it that way, because every single picture we have, they, they talk about that. So I got to the, the, the next session when we talk about that. I mean, I'm just going to add two issues to, to the point you raised. Uh, firstly, there is no intention to replace existing regional or national data institution if they do exist. I think what we're talking about is the set global data. So that's it. That's the one thing that works. You need national institution and you need regional institution. And I think when you look at the issue of the FBI and one of the key areas where we did not have the data, that is the case. And one of the reasons is because of sovereignty of countries or the availability of data that can be made. So, if you're dealing with it, there will be areas where a collective decision on making available sensitive data is the only way to go for it. If we want to make sure that some of the issues that we are fighting for, we have the evidence. So, that is one of the key reasons why we're talking about a global set. Data. It's not the intention to replace uh, existing institutions, but what the intention is to strengthen those institutions. And I think we have a public foundation which has already agreed to provide the assistance, and that's up to regional and national institutions. Work on what their needs are, whether it's a class community, whether it's an infrastructure, that, that's a, entirely up to, it's not to replace what is already existing. I'm looking around again. So that is, is the coffee ready? We broke up early. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think people would like to have a break and stretch their legs, get some fresh air. So we're we're doing really good in terms of our task uh, today because the program keeps working. <laughs> yes. Uh, so on my right, uh, also I have uh, Mr. Gopal, who's the IGO Global, uh, which is the IGO Global UN System Director for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, regional integration and international trade for Mauritius. Uh, and on the second, uh, on my left, I have Ms. Nicole uh, who is here on behalf of the Solomon's uh, National Health Authority, uh, Chief Planning Officer, Ministry of Planning uh, and Development of uh, Solomon Islands. 
Um, so given that we have a little bit of time, I'll, I'll give them the leeway and maybe give you 10 minutes. So, Mr. Uh, so Paul, you have the... Uh, let me start by thanking our friends in the heart. Thank you to uh, our colleagues from the UN for inviting us. Appreciate it to uh, be part of this. Uh, of this So uh, let me start by uh, going to uh, some, I would call, preliminary classes. Um, this is covered by our previous speakers. But uh, briefly today, that um, from 1992, from the Rio Summit to uh, about um, Measures and 
the recent one that we announced in uh, 2024 and 2025 uh, related to uh, sustainable finance. For instance, we have established a climate and sustainability fund, and the initial allocation is of 3.2 million rupees. We have also um, proposed a super tech levy on top with this mobilized fund for climate change. Um, as we go waste management, uh, we have the plan is to bring in private sector. Uh, so we are we are trying to develop uh, regional integrated waste processing facilities. On energy transition, we have stated uh, suggestions to have a government support agreement to allow up to uh, 15 or rather over 15 billion rupees of private sector investment in the coming two years. And uh, when moving to climate adaptation. Uh, the plans and resources have been for flood management as well as um, several weeks of uh, restoration. And then uh, you would agree to be that uh, whatever figures are not stated are far from digital, but we all require. And here this is where I have some things when we talk about debt relief and conceptual finance, conceptual finance. And innovating, innovating mechanism advocated in Abba. And the fourth point I have identified is uh, with regards to education. Here's the second one. Now, here we know that the bath and fertilizer and students are in the instrument as it Early STEM education, vocational training. And uh, it's a way uh, of developing the local work advantage of emerging and um, among others. This one is uh, the city and the great thing that this has been envisaged in and we expect uh, that center to be able to build the kind of capacity development. So as we build new skills in the emerging sector, such as digital technology and sustainable tools. Six um, is um, about technical assistance and capacity building of local institutions. This is very important if you want to enhance our ability to implement sustainable development policies and programs. And here we are talking about uh, better so as to be able to better manage climate change and integrate uh, sustainability in the national development system. Uh, for instance, uh, in my own country, we employ a comprehensive approach to create sustainable development across all national countries. And um, one of such key strategies. Uh, the uh, region 2030, which aligns uh, to our national, which aligns our national development priorities. We will partnership with national partners, with Last that is 
coming up. Uh, we are all talking about in the May about monitoring the uh, about the uh, specific time bound commitment with milestone for progress in the various sectors covered with the three new energy target, infrastructure projects, uh, and human capacity. And in this regard, um, the commitment to expand and data collection and enforcement mechanism uh, is highlighted and commended. The impact on our own Vienna extended in Sudan. There were some issues with this data. And I think um, we all have some issues with data. We, there may be some issues that are existing already, but uh, something we need to see how to improve. Uh, 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 data collector and uh, uh, if we have data properly analyzed, we can definitely monitor and for planning uh, we should go into a new uh, Second is um, alignment with uh, global frameworks like Paris Agreement and the standard framework for EDR, which uh, are either with um, climate resilience and disaster management. The third uh, and the most important is uh, about alignment with the about agenda and third. In fact, uh, if we look at ABAP, we can relate uh, ABAP to each of the seven And you um, are in our own Vienna, and the report that we presented in my life, critical areas of the ABAP, can make an impact. Um, some of them are related to uh, food security. Uh, in fact, we are identifying uh, identify and sustainable agricultural practices as vital for country as it is. Um, it also identifies investment in resilient infrastructure. Um, and here, our 2024 2025 budget has allocated significant resources for development of climate resilient infrastructure uh, to align with SDG 9. And the third example would be promotion of uh, renewable energy. Uh, and we talk, I can talk about uh, uh, our target being our green, uh, 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 our energy mix with uh, green forces to 60%. Uh, and this one aligns with uh, LGBT. And our the fourth uh, alignment would be uh, the focus the focus of uh, on, on global partnership 
and we know that the area has been in 30 emphasizes a global partnership for development and about to be is a different as uh, it recognizes the role of uh, international cooperation and in that case and it has to be for this uh general in some as well. Now uh, let's uh, see how about is missing from um, uh, existing trade. Uh, there is also a lot of commonalities between existing frameworks and other. So, what distinguishes about is its tailored approach to the unique aspects of it. And here we can highlight uh, about specifically targeting the unique challenges that we face as this, uh, such as extreme vulnerability dimension, geographic isolation, limited approach, and on external markets. Again, it's, uh, while Agenda 2030 broadly covers environmental sustainability and health and conservation, about stated uh, emerging from the uh, uh, issue. The first is uh, about our process maritime mm -hmm. security challenges which are unique to our city. Uh, and this includes the participation of regional cooperation to combat maritime crime, a human trafficking legal this is coordinating and then we can extend this maritime border and uh, here I will highlight that the one that and so we can be so that if you need him to do it to maritime security, uh What's the board and energy factors at the international, regional, and national level? Uh, 
So here, I think we need to see what goes into terms like thermal fields, uh, ICT and NICAR complaints. We will have a regard to uh, this, trying to integrate them uh, so that they can benefit from a uh, global value chain. In fact, um, they should um, recognize focus at uh, each focus at the level of the field. And uh, we are somehow groups and uh, what is the next week is small cellular economy. So it's by size of economy rather than our effectivity that we have to do when it doesn't really help in pushing the kids agenda at the level of the field. And of course, Michael has a lot of work that he does in some kind of way. Very often, those are uh, either not uh, well uh, known by the so uh, that we can take real advantage of uh, whatever assistance and facilities are given by a white uh, we regard in a way. And if you want to develop, if you want to move ahead, innovation would be very important. And the second thing is, um, when we are talking about trade and, and investment, quite a number of bilateral trade agreement investment agreement that uh, is now concluded. Uh, we have to ensure that uh, it's uh, interest are uh, really catered for in such agreement, and it needs to be reviewed existing agreement needed to be at the regional level, um, the issue for strengthening uh, uh, of regional bodies, uh, for example, for my own region, we have the Indian Ocean Commission. do an excellent job. Uh, we also have uh, the Indian Ocean Supreme Association. Uh, the zero guidance is to be able to coordinate efforts in connecting regional strategies uh, for climate resilience, disaster management, uh, blue economy, and uh, other uh, areas as well. Shared infrastructure and connectivity can also be uh, uh, an important example. So the need to develop regional transportation and communication network uh, are going to be that if you want to move into island space. Now, uh, in the Indian Ocean, we have two islands, the region, uh, Alagasca, Asia, Maldives, um, and, uh, and I don't really uh, know how much we need to pay. And I presume it really is significant. So if we could, uh, uh, one is reduced probably the cost of trade. Second is the uh, improved uh, cooperation between uh, cities. Sometimes uh, during challenging moments uh, where markets close during COVID, so we can do. Uh, some work together to do that. Uh, our food security uh, is, uh, is maintained, for example. Uh, the second is uh, regional climate action and urban resource management. Um, and here, uh, projects uh, relating to marine conservation, rural reefs, restoration, and peace management. I mean, if you are a small country, small island, and middle of the ocean, you can do uh, all the development and regional cooperation that would uh, definitely come in here. And uh, the third one is the uh, early warning and disaster management. Um, I think that the third one has included uh, quite a few of them in this early warning project. Uh, that is happening. And if we could uh, uh, establish regional networks for early warning systems, 
And I don't know whether uh, I tell you there is nothing can happen if there is not uh, a required public man by the, the national um, And then coming to is something else. We need to build the things on our path. And the second thing that is also even more important, we need to involve all relevant things so that if we want uh, to actually uh, in implementing uh, that. Uh, the second issue here is the climate and environmental policies. Uh, we have not yet, we need to develop our national adaptation plan. Uh, or if we have one, we probably need to update the software properly and comprehensively have a kind of going around it. Third one is, as I said earlier, in the presentation of capacity building in the new and new design of the NPR, education and skills development would be uh, a reason to ensure. The technical Moving on to uh, the next question is uh, Yeah. Okay. Uh, what best practices from Amoa pathway can be carried forward to effective implementation of ABA? Um, yeah, I'll focus this briefly and we can probably discuss uh, later. The first is um, a strong international and regional partnership. Samoa uh, pathway emphasize uh, the importance of such partnership. So, uh, Not only when it comes to implementation of Samba, 
and also the number of projects that uh, so the, uh, one of the latest uh, framework which I find very interesting is see the UN and sustainable development uh, framework very Second partnership would be with international financial institutions, um, well and higher and regional development. Um, the, the support of the institutions would be um, required in terms of financing infrastructure projects and finance uh, based uh, Third, regional organizations. Uh, we need to enhance collaboration within, we and within this model. Uh, in the end of the I like we have the Indian Ocean Commission. Um, at the recent uh, meeting of the uh, IOC Council, uh, the IOC has uh, decided that we should uh, set up a, a mechanism for the full procurement of central tools. So these, these are examples uh, where, from where we can learn. And, and uh, we have a similar mechanism with uh, the of regulation for African cities uh, for the full procurement of We all know the challenges we face during COVID-19 when it came to uh, COVID, COVID vaccination and uh, other uh, elements. Okay. Uh, for uh, the partnership, um, I think it's a uh, uh, fair on the ability to go on. Uh, and coming about uh, in our feedback session. It is uh, mentioned again in the social media. And uh, yeah, most of our people have a uh, uh, privileged relation with the EU. Uh, I don't know uh, the, now the Samoa women uh, uh, signed, adopted signed last year or through some other uh, arrangement. So, um, you know, European Union, uh, partners like uh, UK, France, Australia, US, they are all important for them for us when it comes to technical assistance and financial support. And I take this opportunity to add my voice uh, in uh, to, to our partners to uh, come to us, talk to us, we, we, we need to work together to be able to implement our life. And uh, we have also noted that uh, some of our bilateral partners do have dedicated capacity for it. Maybe we need to engage in a conversation with these uh, partners to uh, see whether their strategy do we have to our situation and do the um, uh, help or would help us in achieving one of our uh, as fun. So we, we need to go. Uh, consultation is important. Conversation is important if we want to uh, first not to finish uh, our conversation as well and uh, move in a more coordinated uh, 
and it got the response. Private sector, uh, I spoke about that earlier. Uh, uh, private, public private partnerships need to be promoted, uh, catalyzing them in such a purpose. And of course, uh, involvement of the society and the media is also uh, to be uh, taken seriously if you want. Everybody will be on board. And the last one, not the last, we call out is a partnership with uh, universities and research institutions. Uh, we need to work with them if we want to innovate, if we want to move ahead, if we want to uh, enhance our research capacity. And the last one is. Uh, that the right engagement uh, very effective how uh, a very important side of the story. We've been talking about uh, really that the last one has been in our system. They can also bring in uh, their expertise that they will have acquired. Uh, they can bring in their resources. Uh, to help you in uh, maintenance. I'll stop here. I want to answer two questions. Otherwise, it will go on the end of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gopal. We do have a bit of time, so maybe when we get to the discussion, there might be specific questions to where you can elaborate on the slides and what I'm able to understand. Um, so it's my pleasure to turn down to Mr. Kilama, or if you have any more questions. I don't know if I don't know one. Um, my name is Majiko Pelavo. I'm here representing uh, my permanent secretary, who is not in attendance due to other commitments. Uh, so I will try my best to deliver this presentation to the best of my ability. So for uh, this presentation, I will be concentrating on. So, the presentation I want to focus on how uh, Solomon Islands is localizing uh, the ACAS into our uh, national development strategy as well as our national planning uh, process. And I will also be highlighting some of the lessons uh, there in uh, some more pathway. So uh, my presentation will include a brief uh, overview of Solomon Islands geography and social economy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be on the NBS 2016 to uh, 2035, and also uh, the implementation uh, of the NBS, as well as the localization of APAS into our national uh, process. And I will also highlight some of the lessons uh, from the sum of pathway, as well as providing an update on the current exercise that we are doing on the NBS review. Uh, Uh, we can some of our small business and social equity. So, I think we have been talking about this at some point in the South West. I think actually we are going to have a big stone on the year of the book and some of our problems is very close to the future. So, we are going to have a big stone on the year of the book. Uh, 
The localization of the markets are important and important and was to inform the local region of compromising at the national level, for example, the technical departments to provide several of our activities and the ministry is to encourage them in the departments to align their commitments that their development commitments into our national strategy. So in the middle of the society of states, the so uh, this is uh, just an example of how we are mapping uh, our work in the international context. So we have the RBS objectives, and then we have the RBS membership uh, strategies, as well as the development of the daily priorities, and then we have the RBS. So just to show you a picture of how we are doing at the national level. So I think um, one of the lessons is the absence of a structured implementation monitoring and evaluation framework. The summary was that the comprehensive framework to guide the implementation of the summer pathway. This is now resulted in a certainty that we can look what we should be reporting and how the reporting should be conducted at the national level. Secondly, lack of dedicated means of implementation. The international level, there was some dedicated funding allocated to support the implementation of the summer pathway. Security is a critical challenge, which should be a priority moving forward for effective implementation of MAPAS. And then, uh, as it also allocations and language of programs and activities, those process and projects are to specifically our course of activities. And this aspect may be crucial for our framework to ensure focus and result oriented implementation. And finally, this sufficient awareness and socialization. Particularly among the learning languages and relevant stakeholders was limited. Increasing awareness and socialization efforts will be vital to ensure better understanding and action of the others as well as the summer pathway. 
just to give a review on uh, what we currently doing uh, as the NDS review. So uh, currently, uh, the, our NDS is uh, currently under review. We the compilation and validation of a progress. We are assessing the extent of the NDS and has Thank you uh, very much to the presenters uh, for the very insightful presentations. In particular, uh, the pathways they've shown or shared uh, towards localizing others to both the sub regional uh, and national level uh, and integrating the lessons uh, from the Star Wars pathway. And I'm sure you'll have questions uh, with me over the course of a short time uh, from the, the two presenters and, you know, and just reflections on what they've done. Uh, nationally, I, I would say that you know, the Solomon Islands are very impressed uh, about what you've done from the, the get go in, in terms of your management, uh, your cabinet papers, uh, and we heard the plea from uh, development, your development partners about the fact that you do need funding uh, to be able to, uh, to implement uh, this. So let me just take a few minutes uh, just to discuss uh, from the ISCAPs. Uh, point of view, what we are uh, doing in Kutu in, in terms of uh, supporting uh, the implementation of AMA. Um, and that's because the, when we look at our own uh, UNESCO Gap strategic plan, there's uh, you know, really great alignment uh, with uh, you know, the key actual commitments uh, in other, um, but of course, um, uh, ISCAP. Uh, Position, there is still a significant opportunity for us to enhance uh, our support uh, in terms of uh, resilience and uh, prosperity. And uh, our executive secretary has requested that we develop a strategy for supporting countries in special situations. And of course, that includes uh, said that we're, we're working uh, on that. Um, so it is a you know, uh, both uh, the uh, UNESCO strategic plan uh, and other, uh, you know, emphasize sustainable development, resilience, and inclusivity. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, support mechanisms, uh, the mandate of ISCAP uh, is that as we build a technical system, 
uh, online platform and databases and sharing of best practices across the uh, every state. A key area of our work is facilitating access to finance. Um, and for our part, uh, we can assist countries in terms of uh, leveraging international commitments for climate finance and development aid. And we have supported countries to develop energy finance and climate, uh, climate finance, uh, such as SDG linked bonds and debt to climate bonds. Um, in terms of uh, climate action uh, and resilience, we have all thoughts uh, that we can help countries uh, with in terms of preparing uh, for natural disasters. And in terms of biodiversity and ocean sustainability, uh, we are gearing up and supporting the member countries of Asia and the Pacific for the 2025 Oceans Conference. And in particular, we are focusing on ocean based uh, climate action. Uh, in terms of the evaluation, we will have a, a dedicated session uh, after lunch uh, on this. And we have very recently in the Pacific completed uh, implementing guidelines to assist uh, Pacific states uh, to develop a sound national integrated framework to monitor and evaluate national regions and global framework. And then finally, turning to partnership. Um, one of the key uh, sort of uh, messages that uh, I keep, you know, saying to our Pacific uh, members is that to use UNS gap uh, as, you know, the Asia Pacific uh, regional forum because of the, the number of members we have, uh, and it can be your sort of uh, gateway to the, you know, to the global forum. I know and I acknowledge that our Pacific is have been over many years very successful in both directly to New York. But I think we have not really fully utilized uh, the platform that ASCAP uh, can provide uh, for Pacific States in, in terms of advocating uh, and supporting uh, Pacific States. So, with those few comments, let me turn to my uh, colleague from the Forum of Pacific Community to also just provide uh, some comments as, as a discussion. Uh, before we open Thank you. Thank you, uh, moderator. And uh, just to thank the uh, host government as well as the organizers of this event to, for this opportunity to come and uh, share uh, some of the lessons in the development of the 2050 strategy. Uh, as well as the ways that we could also assist in terms of the implementation of our task. Uh, I thought just to briefly provide some background on the 2050 strategy for the, those who may not be aware of it. Uh, so the 2050 strategy was endorsed by leaders back in 2022, uh, their meeting in Fiji. And the strategy itself really highlights the the region's uh, high-level vision, as well as our approach to achieving that uh, high-level vision. Um, and the strategy itself is framed around seven thematic areas. Uh, and those uh, areas include uh, political leadership and regionalism, people-centered development, which includes uh, areas such as health, education, um, human rights, and culture. Uh, we also have uh, climate change and disasters, ocean and environment, uh, technology and connectivity, which also uh, are areas that align to the, the focus areas of our past and uh, the 2030 agenda. Um, so just in terms of the development of the strategy, uh, one of the key uh, highlights of development is really an inclusive and robust process, uh, really ensuring that the process was led by our member countries and guided by our partners, as well as our crop agencies. Crop being the Council of Regional Organizations in the Pacific, which includes uh, PIFS, uh, the uh, Pacific Community, SPC, and USP, to just name a few. Um, so, I mean, that was really a, a, an important aspect of the development was to ensure that it was a member-led process that uh, we ensured to in, include 
uh, all of the issues and priorities from the national level. Uh, and this process was also supplemented by uh, mapping of the SDGs uh, with the member countries uh, to map the priorities for their national development plans. Um, in terms of the implementation plan, the first phase is underway. Uh, we have uh, the implementation plan was endorsed uh, in Cook Islands at the leaders' meeting in 2023. Um, and it's really the, this first phase of the implementation plan will take us now to 2030 uh, before the next review. Um, leaders have agreed that 2024 is a year of transition as the region works together to implement the priorities and decisions from ministerial level all the way up to our leaders. Uh, in addition to the implementation plan, uh, one of the key taskings from uh, Pacific leaders was the review of the regional architecture, which is uh, really um, the process where we will look at our own region, the various governing mechanisms and institutions that exist, and how we can better align to the priorities uh, under the, the 2050 strategy. Uh, so this is an ongoing process. Uh, this tasking came for, to the Secretariat as well as our crop agencies uh, to help uh, facilitate this process. Um, and uh, we are currently in the third phase of the review of the regional architecture. Uh, this also includes a review of our partners within the region uh, and how we, the partners can better align uh, and help implement the 2050 strategy. Uh, in terms of the MEL, for the 2050 strategy, we have in the implementation plan a set of high level uh, uh, principles which were endorsed by leaders. Uh, these principles we have started to unpack uh, through a MEL working group, which consists of our members from both planning and statistics office, as well as our uh, MEL experts from our crop agencies uh, to help support this process. Um, so, the MEL approach as well within the 2050 implementation plan also highlights our failure of change, how we achieve from our system outcomes, how we achieve the uh, system outcomes to help achieve our people uh, outcomes as well as uh, the overall goal under each of the next 12 years. Uh, and as I had mentioned, as part of the MEL process is the National Development Plan uh, mapping. Um, and this is a continuous pro process that we are doing with the countries. Uh, some are coming towards the end of uh, the uh, uh, National Development Plans and are planning new ones. Uh, and there are others that are still uh, have just developed. So it's just ensuring the alignment as well as ensuring that the 2050 strategy helps support the achievement of national priorities. Um, and then just finally on the reporting to leaders. Uh, so this year in Tonga, uh, leaders had endorsed the first phase of reporting, which we are calling the baseline report. Uh, and it really sets out uh, where we are as a region in terms of our progress towards uh, in terms of our progress towards our goals and outcomes outlined in the 2050 implementation plan. Uh, in addition to the baseline report, we also have a um, high-level summary of prioritized regional collective action. So within the implementation plan, if you do manage to get a copy, uh, which I, I think are displayed outside, we have our goals, our outcomes, and we also have under each thematic area, a set of regional collective actions, which will help, so, uh, help us in achievement of our, our goals and outcomes. Um, in terms of the, the report, uh, or, or this high level summary of prioritized action, uh, our members had uh, identified around 26 regional collective actions that they have prioritized to implement uh, between 2024 and 2025. 
So in terms of resourcing, uh, in terms of partnerships, and how we achieve our actions, we are really working with our member countries um, to help uh, get as much support as we can for these uh, regional collective actions. Uh, and then just finally on the 2050 dashboard, uh, the 2050 dashboard was really uh, work that we have been doing with the SDC through the Pacific Data Hub. Uh, and we have been working with the statisticians there in SPC to really identify key indicators uh, from the SDG set of indicators that align to the, the outcomes within the 2050 strategy. So we have uh, developed a dashboard which was launched in Tonga and it's uh, up if anyone wants to view it. Um, and it really shows how countries uh, individually are progressing towards uh, achieving the outcomes within the within the 2050 strategy. Uh, in terms of alignment and support, I mean, the 2050 strategy really highlights the key uh, areas or key issues uh, from member countries in terms of what member countries want to achieve in the Pacific. Uh, and we look forward to working with the, the UN uh, through the review of the regional architecture process and through other uh, mechanisms to ensure that uh, uh, we can highlight uh, this and also use existing mechanisms such as the dashboard to help support the, the data, the information uh, uh, within the, the achieving the advice. Thank you very much.
I'm just I'm just taking my vows. I'm just taking a present online from this guy. If not, I'll, I'll send the message. If not, I'll just get a message to Chris that well, when he's doing his intervention in the next session, we just spend another talking about the intervention time. So, is anybody else uh, just checking the, the room? Okay. So, uh, our staff member then is this in the UK. Testing one, two. Uh, okay. So thank you, um, moderator, for the session, and really um, thanks to the government of Vanuatu for the very good hospitality. My name is Ken Roy Roach. I'm the um, head of the resident coordinators office for Barbados in the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, good to be here. Um, I really enjoyed, I wanted to comment on the presentation from uh, Mauritius. I really enjoyed the presentation uh, in terms of the, the, the substance and the ideas that were put on the table, but I wanted to zoom in on one aspect that you mentioned, um, because I think it might be helpful to the national focal point. You know, we are going through the, um, the NDC formulation process uh, globally uh, many countries are looking at their NDCs and updating their NDCs, and there's an expectation that those will be filed, um, will be um, registered by February 2025. And I think it's a good opportunity to think about um, how to land some of the um, environment and climate um, related um, commitments under the ABAS so that these processes are somehow integrated especially given that for SID, uh, they're very limited capacity. And I think this was partly the thinking behind um, in the presentation from Mauritius when we talked about the climate and environment policies and looking at the national adaptations. Um, of course, from a mitigation perspective, SIDs are not huge emitters, but from the adaptation perspective, there may be some opportunities there for looking at that. So I just wanted to flag that and really to commend the presentation um, from from Mauritius, they thought was quite thorough and comprehensive. Uh, I thought um, that these presentations were really interesting and really comprehensive. Um, I really also I really enjoyed the presentation from um, from Solomon Islands and um, that I agree with Teresa as well. I think it's really fantastic that you've also already socialize the um, ABAS and that you have incorporated those into your plan. Um, also because, you know, incorporating the ABAS into the national plan and so on makes sure that we can have the reflection for the different goals and so on that we're all talking about. And I just wanted to say because someone said... Sorry. Oh, we need to know that I'm right. Okay. Um, in the, um, I think you had a slide um, in the representation of the Mauritius looking at the different kind of relationships that the countries um, can have. Um, that you pointed out that there's a bilateral relationship with donors. So just from the point of view of a donor, um, I would just like to encourage that you also think about your relationship with donor partners in terms of also how that relates to other relationships. Because in donors like the UK, um, we also have quite an important role, for example, in multilateral development banks with board members and so on as well. Um, and also in terms of our relationship with regional organizations. So, for example, some of our programming, which is quite so its focus, also goes through regional organizations, Caribbean bodies, for example, in the Caribbean, or through um, perhaps Pittsburgh or the Commonwealth, and so on, and other um, bodies which are, um, which may be our regional, but also have an important Pacific Express and, and other organizations in the Pacific, for example. So the donor relationship with those organizations is also important. So we worked for advantage 
and some people still help people like me because um, we are I think, unusual in doing this and having an office bringing together the interests of the kids in our national administration, but helping to socialize the idea of our kids' priorities also in our own administration. Um, which which supports our interventions, for example, working with SIDS, supporting the AOSIS, um, supporting the UN to um, um, to also um, pursue our objectives of SIDS. Also, FCAP as well, I think, the brand new capability and capacity building conference of SIDS with FCAP and Bangkok um, in the run up to the fall of this year. So, I just would like to encourage this to be thinking about your relationship with bilateral donors, also how you can leverage that as well in terms of the other relationship to achieve some goal. Thank you. My name is Gansi, I'm representing the government of Anderson Kambabida. Just let me say that I'm happy to be here. Um, especially to discuss the last event that World National Service Conference was organized. Also, thank you to the migrant student who will have delivered their presentation. Um, we need to work on the class. So, as I said, I, be I just wanted to touch um, on Mauritius. Mauritius. Mauritius' point about the need for more private sector engagement. Um, I think that is a very key issue. I think a lot of implementation is usually left up to the government um, to be done with the government as well. So I think we need to um, develop more privacy and strategies, um, especially um, to help in a lot of de risking improve more investments in you know, our climate um, adaptation goals for all countries. Um, I think as well to we need to build more institutional arrangements because we know the GCM that are trying to fund these loan agencies. There is funding here, there is funding available. However, we have to still face the challenge of accessing it because we don't have the proper institutional arrangements. Um, so I think a lot of it has to be focused on strengthening our institutional arrangements, stakeholder marketing plans, and other sectors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chanel Hamilton from the Bahamas. Thank you to the government of Vanuatu for hosting this event. I have a question as well as a bit of a comment after what my colleague, Maxi Grandbrother, said about the procurement process and pool procurement. So, with regards to WHO, I was just wondering what that pool procurement process was like and how it was mutually beneficial to all of the countries involved. Because as we mentioned, yeah, there are projects that are multi-country where a country like the Bahamas signs on but doesn't receive as much funding or as much technical assistance that would be desired. So I'm just wondering what that WHO procurement process is like, and if we have any other examples of equitable procurement processes in I'll, I'll just pass uh, the floor to our colleague to Mauritius, and I understand that we are going to also the room today, Mark. Uh, I think for the first one on the WHO, I don't know. I believe our colleague from the WHO. But uh, I mean, the, the idea of improvement uh, relating to, to medicine, medication, medicine, came up after the challenges we faced during COVID. We had big challenges purchasing uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, to be able to protect our population. And, and it seems that one of the biggest um, challenge was actually a very small market. At the end of the day, even vaccination at some point in time, a lot of people. So, uh, one way of uh, um, having a, a, a market size, which might be Economically viable for, for people is to bring together uh, all the. Right, so I think probably our colleague from uh, 
the place of my talk about the details of the mechanism. And the second uh, mechanism that I just mentioned about the tool group behind the architecture that is that tool. Uh, that is the Indian route in which uh, we group the Mauritius, Comoros, Madagascar, Seychelles, and uh, Uranium Island in the French. Um, and here we are talking about, uh, for a small country like Mauritius, uh, all Seychelles, um, or Comoros, uh, which are very dependent on food. Uh, for their own security program. Um, and then you have a big uh, island, which is Madagascar, which uh, also produces uh, quite a uh, number of items uh, related to uh, uh, food. And Those are possibilities of working together, and this mechanism is now going to be developed. It's a very recent mechanism. Three, four months of April, the field of law. So uh, the Indian Mission Commission and our better development. So if that, I'm um, just checking that that we are here for more calling to the moment and then we go to Star Wars. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. My name is Lydia Bo. I'm the head of office of the WHO based in here in Vanuatu. And uh, largely the UN agencies are reporting to uh, the UN agencies in the office. So uh, in regard to your uh, comments, uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much for sharing uh, this. Um, how actually, what was the detail of having uh, this uh, procurement uh, for the procurement uh, in your country in like the other region? Uh, I don't have the detail, but probably uh, we can all revisit uh, um, and then remember that during the COVID time, it was largely started in 2020, and then I think we now in 2022. Uh, the Rachel was the secretary for the COVAX facility. Because globally, uh, as during this pandemic that affected all the every single country in the world, uh, there was a huge demand to match up the, the demand size and also the supply side, the story for the drugs, medicine, equipment, and also the vaccines going forward. Um, so the, during this time, actually, we were one, and then uh, it was uh, um, largely coordinated by the WHO headquarter, and then Dr. Tudor said, all of you know, and then I was at the center of this coordination. Um, so the, uh, to, uh, many countries actually supported the uh, COVID facility mechanism, and then uh, to have a full discussion, uh, particularly for the vaccine supply countries and also vaccine recipient uh, recipient countries. And also there were a huge coordination mechanism to be able to supply all the PPEs and uh, equipment test kits and all these things actually uh, flew uh, uh, very smoothly from the donating country, donating agencies and private sectors into the countries through the supply mechanism. WH is not the only agency who actually uh, out the, the process. For example, we also uh, teamed up with other UN agencies at you know, the UNICEF, and then to uh, uh, have a uh, um, good collaboration uh, with their supply chain. So probably um, we can unpack this, how it, uh, the exact mechanism works, and then how we can actually make this, that kind of uh, rather easy a uh, supply mechanism for the sub region in the Pacific, the Caribbean, and other uh, these countries. Um, just one last comment. Um, for example, in the Pacific, I'm sure that the same mechanism also exists in the Caribbean. Many countries, human resources, and then drugs are regulatory mechanism. Uh, is the uh, Pacific region works as a one block? Because there is a constant flow of human resources between countries, and also the somehow the um, uh, the capacity uh, if it is the when we actually block all these countries in one uh, uh, block. So uh, we have we have been actually supporting for, uh, to create the kind of sub regional mechanism uh, to be able to govern that process. So probably this is also another uh, example uh, how we can actually take some example out of all the support implementation of that. Thank you very much. I've got all the best done too. Thank you very much. And uh, there's something here that I'm, I'm sort of not quite sort of uh, getting from the presentation, and maybe I could get uh, clarification. Uh, 
some comments in the addresses. We have not heard the issue of national strength by someone in terms of how they are localizing the efforts for implementation. And then there is also uh, comments in terms of regional strength um, from the Pacific and how that is moving forward. But the issue of this is the issue of funding, finance. Now, my question is, how do you see this process moving forward? Are we saying, and, and this is the question to everyone, are we saying that um, it's up to countries and region to secure, to look for those findings, to help them in terms of their implementation? Or do you perceive a broader coordination mechanism that sits yet put in place? Uh, because I, I think, as yes, all of you were aware, it's not just about our partners, it's not just about the UN system, it's not about capital uh, funding, uh, civil society. I think it's a combination of all of them. And somewhere along the line, I think we need to have some coordination mechanism where we can look at some of these plans, whether at the regional or national level, and, and see where the shortfalls are, where the gaps are in terms of funding. And then uh, the next question is, how do you then go about picking those gaps? And one of the things that uh, we will be putting in place in New York next month is an uh, ambassadorial coordination committee. And that is going to be sold from two countries from each of these three uh, regions, which will be the Caribbean, the Asian region, and the Pacific. And that is open to everyone. And then what we do is to keep track of all this development and uh, see where we can assist direct uh, resources or get the engagement and having conversations uh, with our partners and the IFI and the FTPs. Because I think at some point, we have to share that, those uh, those lessons and practices that we engage in. Now, just two questions, one to Mauritius. Uh, I think you raised a very important uh, issue in terms of partners, and, and I think you, you referred to South-South and triangular cooperation. But I think it could be important, and I think you'll find that in the address under uh, the action cluster that deals with uh, partnership is the reference to six city partnership. Now, that is something new under the address because I think uh, there was a deliberate decision to include that. What we're saying to our partners is that we ourselves need to demonstrate that we are also capable of helping ourselves before we ask them to assist. And I think that that is a sustainable way of maintaining partners, not just asking, but also demonstrating what we can bring to the table in terms of helping themselves. So I think you're absolutely right. And it's not meant to replace uh, South North North South cooperation is meant to complement that. And then finally, uh, on this issue of early warning, which you referred to as well, I think uh, experience has demonstrated we're going to have a lot more of disaster. And I think, you know, what you said about needing to sort of work with the institution, whether it's early warning system, or DLR is extremely important. 
and we're already doing that. Perhaps uh, you've heard of SOC, uh, Systematic Observation Financing Limit, as well as Group, as well as RIP, Risk Informed Early Action Partnership. And I think that these are the sort of initiatives that small island development state should be engaged in. And I think we did mention that specifically also in the uh, address. So I think those are sort of, I just mentioned those as concrete examples of, you know, how we can partner with some of these issues and to bring their expertise and support on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's I'll give Marisha the opportunity to respond and then I'll turn it to Jessica and this will be the final uh, commentation before I take a break for lunch. I can see Sylvan's to get to go for lunch. Thank you, Ambassador. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I wonder whether I need to answer. <laughs> Uh, I, I didn't sense there was a question, but uh, thank you for elaborating further on what uh, I said. Um, of course, um, the best place to go and learn about uh, how to deal with our issues is to go to people taking these issues. And this is where I think this uh, cooperation exchange of uh, good practices. Um, uh, important. And we are, um, most of us, all of us, already doing that uh, within the regional or sub regional organizations uh, that we belong to. For example, like the Mauritius and the Indian Commission. Uh, what we promise and uh, need to uh, reinforce is, um, or in some cases, we can is to have that uh, inter-regional exchange, uh, which um, is to me also important. Okay. And I, I was uh, listening to our friend uh, from the Pacific Island program. Um, when it comes to cities in the African region, we are, we do, we uh, all the island right? So uh, there is uh, this, uh, Geographical spread that goes from China to the other side of the Atlantic. If so, um, here I think uh, coordination and exchange of, of uh, experience is a real challenge. We need to address that. That is why I want to thank you for. Thank you, and I'll hand over to Mr. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you uh, with respect to the private sector engagement in the implementation of ABAS. Just wanted to touch on um, a few points uh, around our SIDS Global Business Network that um, OHR has spearheaded. We had a very dynamic discussion ahead of SIDS 4 in the SIDS Global Business Network forum. 2024, um, where we um, came out with a set of really good recommendations and um, action points around the, the three, the four areas that we discussed during the meeting, including blue green economy developments, um, community empowerment and local solutions, enabling business environment, and um, I think what we touched on here is financing and investment for the implementation of ABAS. So we are um, having a webinar on the 6th of November uh, to go into those recommendations and how we can carry those forward. So we really invite um, the, the national focal points to engage with this process to see how we can contribute and, and, and share your account insights and perhaps gain some from um, the organizations that will be involved. We have some private sector organizations 
as well as you know, the stakeholders and others involved in the process to, to bring out how we can uh, implement those uh, key recommendations from the forum. And you can find that information on our website. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, can I just thank everybody uh, for all your valuable uh, contributions in this uh, first session uh, of our meeting, uh, in particular the you know all our presenters and our discussions, but of course all of those, all of you who have made uh, interventions. Um, I think you all agree we have a very rich and diverse uh, discussion about and having others in the first part of the session, but also uh, in the second part in terms of mobilizing others and the relevance uh, of the time of pathway and the time of mutation and, and the lessons that we have learned uh, from the time of the pathway. Uh, thank you again to everybody. Uh, we're now break for lunch, uh, and I'll just turn to the to see if there's any housekeeping uh, matters. But also thank you to all of those, all of you who are online. Uh, I know we had some challenges uh, in terms of uh, connecting, so please bear with us, and we hope we will reconnect uh, after we've had our lunch break. Thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause. Now, uh, so we'll break for lunch now, as uh, the outgoing moderator has said. We will break for lunch. We will head down to towards the sea. Um, this is there's a strong breeze at the moment, so you'll it's cool, and then uh, we will have our, our lunch, and then we'll be uh, here at about uh, two fifteen to make a two thirty start. So we'll start at two thirty on the dots. Thank you very much, and again, apologies for the glitches in the, the, the internet. I think the internet system is back on now, so it's on strong, so hopefully we will not have any glitches going forward from now. But then enjoy your lunch, and I'll see you all back here at 2.30. Thank you very much. More minutes until everyone uh, uh, arrives, and then we'll, we'll start our second session. So please uh, bear with us, be patient. I think the, um, I apologize for the um, for the glitches, uh, technological gl glitches this morning, but uh, I think we're back on. We should be okay now for the rest of the duration of our of our meeting. Um, while they are making their way uh, over, just a quick announcement that the um, we have directly after the second session, the Vanuatu government is hosting you for a welcome cocktail. So it's just uh, drinks and some. Um, as drinks, uh, including kava, if you are game, um, we dare you to try Vanuatu kava. Um, and it's uh, it, 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 if it's anything, it'll calm you all down. Uh, not that you all need to be calmed down, you're all very calm, uh, but it, it calms you down, and it's a, it's, it's a good, um, relaxant for Vanuatu and most specific islanders who take cover. Um, so please join us uh, if you dare. Uh, if you can't, you cannot have come to Vanuatu without trying Vanuatu cover. So uh, I dare you to try some. Um, and we'll, we'll start from 5.30 to 7.30. We have Vanuatu Songbird. Her name is Vanessa Kwai, who will be entertaining us um, this evening. So um, Pray that the weather holds, um, and um, we will, um, and also tomorrow, I'll just make a quick announcement now. They will, we'll pass around a, um, a, a little uh, um, uh, kind of like a sheet where you, you will decide whether you will be going to the, the, the Wednesday activities, going to the 83 Distillery uh, Island uh, site visit, and then also moving on to the um, to the uh, the Blue Lagoon swim in the afternoon. Um, if you can swim, uh, you will not want to miss the Blue Lagoon. We, we we value the Blue Lagoon. It's really nice. It's a nice way to end a very uh, arduous um, two day uh, meeting. Um, and uh, I would like you to enjoy the beauty of Vanuatu before you head back to your respective homes. Um, 
we will um, so the so on Wednesday morning there will be uh, two buses waiting outside take you to the distillery islands uh, the, the 83 distillery island uh, uh, factory uh, and then from there they'll take you straight to Blue Lagoon which takes about an hour drive and then from there we will have a, a lunch that the hotel will prepare for us and then we will go for swims we will have an afternoon tea then we will wrap up there and then take you back to your respective hotels. And then on um, Thursday morning, you're free. Most of you have flights on Thursday afternoon. You can go for a quick shopping if you want, uh, or quick, quick sightseeing or whatever. Um, and then you come back for your uh, uh, airport transfers at around one, two o'clock. Okay, and uh, for those of you leaving on Thursday, those of you leaving on Friday, we will, uh, you can, you can have Thursday off, and then uh, Friday we will transfer you to you to you to the airport. Okay, so um, we will pass around the sheet tomorrow. Just, it's optional. It's optional. We don't we don't want to force you to to go to that. But I mean, it's you might want to. Uh, I mean, if you couldn't have come to Vanuatu without enjoying a taste of our natural beauty. So, um, I think. With those words, I um, I pass over to um, our moderator. So, unfortunately, um, I, I I want to thank uh, uh, Miss Andrew Fong Toy for for impromptuly uh, taking over from Ambassador Otto Tevi, who for some reason Vanuatu's ambassador to the UN, he was denied boarding at the airport, so he couldn't make it. Uh, to he was he's very disappointed. He's asked me to convey his biggest regret for not being able to be here with you. It's just such a shame that his uh, buddy Ambassador Faturi is uh, no Letur, Letur, Lutero is here, and that he's not around to uh, and and of course all of you um, as the ambassador he would have loved to be here and 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 be part of the discussions, but. Um, and he's also the PCS chair, Civic Small Island Development States chair. So, um, he really, really regrets not. He unfortunately he forgot that he needed to um, uh, do his uh, ETA for tr transit in for New Zealand, and then he was denied. <laughs> and then he tried to download the app, the ETA app, in the, uh, at the airport in JFK. But then he they they couldn't uh, he couldn't do it they wouldn't allow him to so he should he could have done it a week or two before it's, he's learned his lesson let's put it this way it's he's it's never going to happen again um, also unfortunately we we lost about four or five of uh, of our of our uh, uh, participants uh, they were unable to secure transit visas to Australia so that's um, that's uh, it's sad. Um, but um, it's okay. I think there's one or two of them I can see that they're following the through Zoom conferences. So I've talked enough now. I hand over to, oh, and by the way, Ambassador Tanya is also one of the, so the three participants from Cabo Verde could not be here because they couldn't secure uh, transit visas to Australia. So, um, and um, I think, uh, one from Lisbon couldn't also join us because of that. Uh, so it's sad that they couldn't join us, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, we, they can meet in the next, uh, meet with you in the next uh, SIDS National Focal Point meeting. Okay, I'll, uh, and, and of course, Ambassador Tanya was scheduled to, 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 to chair this session. And I thank our very own uh, Juliet uh, Aqua who is Vanuatu's focal point, and she's also the head of uh, our uh, M&E here. So she's, it's well fitted to chair uh, the next, uh, to moderate the, the, the second session of our meeting. Over to you, uh, Juliet. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon, colleagues, distinguished guests, fellows and MPFs. Um, and yeah, welcome to our country. This is your first time in Vanuatu. Hope you are settling in. 
I know some of you are experiencing jet lag, so it's hard being in afternoon session on Monday. So we'll try and um, make this as you know as meaningful and uh, interactive as we can. We have a lot of really interesting and diverse speakers with us this afternoon. Um, so I'm uh, really pleased and honored to be able to step in and help facilitate the session. I've already had a lovely introduction from my colleague, Barbara Mears, it's just for them. My name is Juliet, and I work for the Office of the Prime Minister here, Governor Manawatu. And our office, the Department of Strategic Policy, Planning and Information, serves as an international focal point for Vanuatu and States. Um, so today's discussion centers on the critical periods of ethics, the integration of the ABAS international frameworks, and how ME plays a pivotal role in ensuring successful implementation. And as we all know, the ABAS outlines key priorities for sustainable development in the cities. And when we are looking to turn these priorities into actions, it requires strong foundations, ones built on coordination, monitoring, and the ability to measure the progress effectively. So today's session this afternoon is actually quite important, and we heard uh, quite a few questions and comments from around the room this morning, but we are able to discuss more of these things in detail this afternoon. So we will now listen to progress from the Interagency Task Force for the Abbas, or the IATA, which has been diligently working in supporting coordination of the UN system. They will provide us with an update on the status of the MA framework that is in the heart of the Abbas. Following on from that presentation, we will also have the opportunity to engage in dialogue uh, through our national focal points. And it's really great to see so many of you from different countries around these regions here with us, because we all want to know how we can better align our international systems and mechanisms with the Abbas. We also want to figure out how we can collaborate more effectively with the UN system and other multi stakeholder and uh, other agencies to improve our MA practices. And all of these questions of the discussion today will help shape the future of how we can integrate the rest into our own national sustainable development efforts. So as we begin the session for this afternoon, I would like to encourage each of you to share your experiences, to highlight the successes, and more importantly, discuss some of the challenges we face and opportunities for moving forward. Together, through this exchange, we can continue to refine our approach and enhance partnerships between SIDS, the UN system, and other stakeholders that you can share here with us today, both virtually and in person. So with that, thank you once again for being here, and I would like to introduce our esteemed presenters. Uh, maybe before I introduce our presenters today, um, whilst being here with SIDS, and we're all accustomed to the use of island time, um, and, you know, we're all looking forward to different perspectives from our diverse speakers. So in order for us to give them enough time and also have time to open it up so that we can have some dialogue together, um, I would just like to ask that our presenters keep their presentations for around seven minutes. Um, and then we also have time for some of the lead discussions to come in and they will be given around three minutes as well um, with the intervention. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this session. We have Ms. Tishka Francis, who is head of the SIDS program at the UN OHRLS. We have Ms. Anya Toma, who is the Economic Affairs Officer of the UN NESCA. And we have Ms. Emilia Douglas, who is the National Focal Point for Trinidad and Tobago. And she is the Senior Program Manager of the Sustainable Development Technical Corporation Unit, which is housed at the Ministry of Planning and Development. Uh, and we also have um, Mr. Christopher Ryan from the UAS Cap. He's joining us online today. So, Chris, if you're there, thank you for being here. And I believe um, you have to also answer a few questions that we had in the morning session that. Um, they discussed. So just make sure that you pop that into your presentation when you have your strictly three minutes. Thank you. Now, without further ado, I give the floor to Ms. Francis. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam Chair. And this first presentation is actually going to be jointly done by Mr. and myself. Uh, we are going to focus on updating you very quickly on where the UN system is with developing the mandated monitoring and evaluation framework. Um, uh, quickly, the presentation is going to focus on technology, progress, and then give you a sense of our timelines and um, the outreach that is going to be happening around it. Uh, so, split it in half between Tishka and myself, so I'll take care of the first two, and then Tishka will come in on the last, and then on the last two, and then he'll do a very quick um, sort of wrap up. So, just to orient you on where we are, if any of you have read Abbas at all, there's a paragraph in there uh, which talks about calling for monitoring and evaluation framework um, for the document. And, and there's a little bit of very quickly history behind this. One of the uh, so-called shortfalls of the Moa pathway is that there was no proper sense of how to, to, to monitor progress. Um, if any of you have ever seen the uh, Secretary General's reports that were done on the Samoa pathway, they were very, very uh, qualitative in, in style and approach. It didn't really give you a sense of outcomes, achievements, progress. You saw a lot of things that said, well, we spent this amount of money on this issue, but no result, none of that. And so uh, our, our, this time around, Member States decided that it needs to be a proper monitoring and evaluation framework, which will hopefully at the end of 10 years give us a sense of how um, it's and others have done with the implementation of ABAS. But I want to put it to you that that's just part of a, of a, of a, of a bigger thought process that needs to go in. So the the key elements of, of, of the approach, um, there's going to be a quantitative assessment, um, there's going to be a qualitative assessment, and the focus is obviously going to be on tracking the progress and then the commitments in the section of the document that deals with how these things get there. Uh, the quantitative assessment is going to look quite similar to what you might be accustomed to with the annual progress reports. It is a statistical publication that is going to be done each year and discussed um, during HLPM. Um, and then there's going to be the usual, we did this and we spent that much amount of money in the annual uh, SG's report um, that will also come out uh, every August of, of, of each year. Um, we're going to be approaching the work um, in, 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 in three phases. Um, the first, which is currently on the way, is a comprehensive mapping of uh, all of the relevant frameworks, etc. Because this has made it very clear to us that this must not add any additional burden on their, their systems at the national level. Um, so, so with that, what we have started doing, or what we are in the process of doing, is mapping all of the relevant um, international agreements. Um, the Addis Ababa um, action agenda. I guess when the new um, FFD4 document comes out, that's going to come into play. Sendai, the new Kunming uh, biodiversity framework, all of them. Um, we are taking, going through the process of looking through all of those documents to try and identify relevant indicators and map them onto Abbas to avoid any additional documentation because these should be the uh, indicators that member states are already tracking. And I will put the table up at the very end, which suggests otherwise. But the idea behind it is to not minimize the introduction of any new indicators that could potentially would uh, member states. From there, there's going to be a political process, which I think is probably start when, when she comes in to speak. Um, where there will be a discussion among member states to sort of narrow down um, the, the, the targets. Um, member states have spoken about a four or a minimum set of targets um, that, that will be used to, to, to monitor our bank as we go forward. And once the targets have been identified, which is obviously a political process, we will then um, go to the identification of um, the relevant indicators that can be used to, to, to measure these targets. Um, and, uh, yes, so, so once that is developed, that is then also going to be 
trusted member states, and then from there we will start the process in the information public. So the interagency task force has already been established. Right now, it consists of 33 uh, UN entities, um, which is quite a size of the of experts to manage, but these are, um, uh, uh, these are entities from across the UN system covering all the relevant aspects of APA. The first meeting of the IATF happened uh, last month, um, where there was uh, a sort of an orientation discussion um, at the beginning of, of, of a discussion around the guidance principles, how this group is going to work now. Um, there are plans, I think three is a big group to manage. So there, we are talking about identifying a core group of institutions that will be in terms of the, the identification of the targets and indicators as we go forward. Um, at all times, there is going to be a process of consultation with member states, which, Tis which Tishka will discuss um, when she speaks. But it is going to be a process where we also engage experts at the national level, our national um, statistical directors, offices, um, all of the relevant stakeholders um, who will need to come in on an indicator framework that is relevant um, to SIDS and that tracks progress that is important to SIDS. Um, the first, uh, as you know, the deadline is June of next year. Um, this indicator framework has to be ready um, by then um, for discussion uh, at, at next year's HLPF meeting, which is going to be in, in, in July uh, of, of next year. Um, the new format of the, of the HLPF session where the results of this indicator framework is going to be discussed, it's going to track a little bit more closely the, the way that the overarching HLPF is, is taken. For those of you that follow the HLPF discussions, they usually are around specific uh, SDG indicators. So the SIDGE session is going to start to track that a little bit more closely than it has in order to be able to report on and discuss um, what comes out of, of, of this new um, uh, e evaluation framework. Um, the technical work is being led heavily by the, uh, the UN Statistics Division, and it is going to be following very closely the approach that was taken um, for the identification of the, uh, for the, the targets and indicators for the SDGs. Um, as I indicated, there are going to be two reports um, annually, uh, one which is a statistical publication and one which is more of the, the, the quantitative, the, the qualitative approach to reporting. Um, this is you. Yes. So I'm going to hand over to Tishka. Thank you, Anya. Um, so I, I think we covered a lot of the timeline issues already, but just to um, re reinforce that the work be done by June next year, June 2025, we've heard for meiosis in particular that this needs to be done by then so we can move forward. I, I think I alluded to that earlier this morning um, about the urgency of getting a monitoring and evaluation framework as soon as possible. So we have oriented our work around that and we um, intend to have the um, completion of the IATF's work reflected in the annual report of the UN Secretary General on SIDS, which is, is due in July as, as um, Anya mentioned, so we can um, uh, consider it during the HLPF. So once once the, the information is included in the SG's report, we will have a political discussion in the context of the SIDS resolution in next year's second committee session. And to, uh, uh, we, to achieve this, we are doing the set of targets that um, Anya alluded to. Now, th this is a, a, a very much a political exercise. It's informed, of, uh, again, by um, technical work. But um, SIDS have also told us that they don't want a, a bunch of targets or indicators because these, this is a very difficult and onerous process for them to get through. So we will um, narrow that down for discussions within the AOSIS by November. That, that is the um, timeline that we're working with. 
And following that, again, we will um, work on the indicator framework to be ready by early 2025 to allow sufficient time for the validation exercises that um, we alluded to earlier um, already this morning. Now, um, with respect to the outreach, thank you. We, we of course, recognize the importance of regular outreach and consultation not only with member states, but with other stakeholders. Um, we plan to formally consult um, AOCs at the key moments, including on the, uh, the targets and engaging um, representatives of national statistical agencies, planning ministries, um, and, and that will include, of course, the national focal points. Uh, we will convene regular briefings with all member states um, following achievement of IATF milestones and or as needed um, to update on progress and seek input as, um, as needed. And this will include um, uh, all member states and hopefully um, member states can coordinate themselves um, to bring in the, their their SIDS invoice if they <laughs> need it um, to contribute to the process. But with the process of, of um, making the member states aware of these meetings will be very transparent and, and everyone should be aware, uh, aware of when we have these meetings. We were looking to have the first meeting in um, early October with the member states. Um, but uh, of course, it's early October now, but we, we won't um, wait too long to have it. But we just wanted to have a little bit more concrete information coming out of that mapping exercise before we um, uh, engage the member states. So we will probably, hopefully in the coming weeks, alert you to that, um, the, the, the date for that meeting. And of course, we will keep the national focal points in the loop with that as, as well. Um, the terms of reference for the IETF, it does include um, provisions for the participation of the civil society, academia, and the private sector with the relevant expertise. And they will be consulted in a targeted manner on targets and indicators. So they not, may not necessarily be in the bro broader uh, meetings, but as we need them, we will engage them um, to ensure that we have those um, specific information captured. And we will also briefly meet with a few um, uh, uh, other stakeholders to gauge um, experience uh, and information for developing the ME framework. I believe we would have ODI, uh, uh, we have already engaged with ODI. Uh, so these are the kinds of um, engagements we're looking for to really get a robust um, framework. I believe um, Emily from the ODI should be talking later in the in the next part of the session to see how uh, that kind of engagement can be fruitful for our discussions. And we've already engaged the regional commissions and, 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 uh, and Chris should be able to um, speak to that as well. Um, we speak, we will speak with the RCs during the um, upcoming global resident coordinate, uh, coordinator retreat that should be on 17th, yeah, 17th of October to help them build support for the new framework um, uh, and across the national level as well and discuss more opportunities for them to engage. Um, and this meeting, of course, is an excellent opportunity for the NFPs to really um, think about that, the role of, of their role in developing the re uh, reporting mo and monitoring framework and to um, engage uh, once it's developed and implement. So the key points from this discussion will definitely be taken back to the IATF for, for the work, uh, for their work. Um, so I think, Annie, you wanted to put up a, a screen before we... Um, finish. But basically, that's the overview of where we are with the IATF process. And um, uh, you will, okay, I'll hand it back over to Anne. So we're going to put up a, a, a table um, which was prepared for us by, by our regional commissions about two years ago. Um, when we attempted, when we did a, a statistical analysis of the progress on the Samoa pathway. And there's a bigger point that we want to make in terms of, of, of this issue of monitoring and evaluation. Um, 
and I'll, I'll talk to you about what that is very briefly, very quickly. The point being, we can develop the best possible monitoring and evaluation framework for you. But if, the, if there's no data to put into that framework, you're gonna get something that looks very much like this. The, these were some indicators. These are indicators all from the SDGs. Each of, each of, the, each of the dots represents um, an island, uh, our SIDS members. It is grouped into AIS, Caribbean, and the Pacific. The gray areas are where there's no data whatsoever for our countries. This table is two years old. It's not an old table. Um, if you look at some of the key areas that are uh, important to our economies, for SIDS, if you go to, there's a, there's a, a tourism, uh, there's a tourism one there that measures Tourism by GDP. You had it just now. Most of our islands do not have data for that. There's, there's a poverty indicator. We talk about poverty reduction. Most of our countries do not have data for it across the board. You look, we're talking about blue economy. If you look at the, at the indicators dealing with oceans and seas, most of them are grayed out. As I said, colleagues, this is a two-year-old table. So your M again, I'm just going to say it again, your m and &E framework is only as good as the data that goes into it. If there's no data, you're going to get something that looks like this each year as, as, as time goes on. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much to Tishka and to Anya for the combined presentations. Um, and it was really interesting as well to uh, have some insights, also to see what's come through transitioning from Samoa onto the Abbas, um, taking some of those lessons that you've talked about, and also to get a timeline. I think that's also really important for all of us as we're doing our planning as well in our respective countries, looking at the phased approach and um, just the appreciation that the IATF is also trying to work in line with how countries are actually managing their own internal processes. Um, I think we'd like to turn to um, Kenitha now for her presentation and some insights from her. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator, and thank you to the presentations from mm. Anya and Tishka. So I was just quickly going through my presentation and I'm wondering if I should continue <laughs> because um, I see that um, some of the groundwork have already been started in terms of doing the assessments. And that was one of the things that um, I thought of was very critical for us to, um, to start with. Because I remember when we um, were getting very close to doing the Samoa Pathway Report, um, there was a consultant that was hired that started to look at uh, m and framework, start developing an m and framework for the SMOD just to allow us to be able to, um, to report. And I'm wondering to what extent the work that would have started in that framework, if we can do an assessment to get a sense of, okay, indicators that were developed that were relevant to SIDS, how much of it is actually relevant for the ABBAS that we can actually utilize. Because I think even at that point, there were some um, indicators that had to be, um, that were new because the SDGs didn't cover, um, wasn't covering those um, issues within the, the um, framework. So I think that is one place that we can start as well, in addition to looking at um, what currently exists, but also looking at work that would have started with the Samoa pathway for reporting and see how we can now um, transition that into um, the Abbas as much as it is um, relevant. So, um, sorry. So there um, may not be relevant um, indicators under a specific targets that can be used in terms of the SDGs, um, but 
the target itself might be applicable. So that was something that um, I was looking at as well, because we have, uh, in as much as we not we do not want to um, create reporting burden, and we want to use what is existing, and we're looking at what the SDG framework has we may not be able to match indicator for indicator in terms of what we want to measure in the ABAS, but there is a particular target under the SDG framework that we can use and then probably develop an indicator um, for that. So using that um, as an assessment as well. And once we have a complete framework of targets and indicators for the ABAS, I think that is where the multi-country offices um, come in and the work that they do with the government counterparts in identifying our data providers, data producers, and all the other activities related to data collection. Um, it would be important to start working on the data producers to support um, what needs to be done, because if based on the assessment that we, Anya just um, had on the screen that shows where data isn't available, then we definitely need to start looking at data providers, data producers um, on the ground. So who has the data? Um, can they produce the data? What support do they need for data collection? Because one of the things that we're trying to do in Trinidad and Tobago is work with um, an academic institution for doing a compilation of SDG indicators. And it is expensive. And for the past, I think two years I've been trying to get resource mobilization, trying to work on getting the funding to do the resource, um, to do that um, project, but it's coming up a bit, it's, it's a bit challenging. So even that is the issue as well, because if we do, uh, we have to say that into consideration, if we do identify new indicators, we also have to identify the resources in terms of funding to support the data collection for those um, indicators. So that is going to be something that needs to be considered as well. So another thing that I wanted to touch on is, <clears throat> sorry, um, consideration should be given for the frequency of reporting. So when we had the technical um, workshop in Samoa earlier this year in March, the recommendations coming out of that meeting was for, once we develop the ME framework for the ABAS, that we said should be encouraged to provide a report um, in 20, 20, 2028 um, ahead of the midterm review in 2029. And this is something that I want to revisit in terms of a recommendation, because if we basically starting from a place where data is an issue, then I think we probably need to be testing um, those waters a little earlier than 2028. So if it is that it's we can um, kind of create a cycle of reporting for every two years, and I guess in the period now, it will probably be 2027 before we get to the midterm um, in 2029. And then to, um, every two years after that, at least doing it in 2027 gives us a kind of a baseline as to where we are in terms of data. So at least to 2029, there are certain things that we would have to put in place. At least it gives us enough time to put those things in place because we know we have issues with resources. We have issues with institutional mechanisms and it takes time for those things to be implemented. So waiting until 2028 to do, to do start doing a report in anticipation for the midterm review in 2029, I don't think it gives sets enough time to do any sort of um, course correction and put in things in place once you do a report and identify what the gaps are. So all things being equal, um, should we have an m and framework before the end of 2025? <laughs> I propose that it should attempt to at least do a first report in 2027. Um, a lot of resources are going to be poured into strengthening capacity and establishing strengthening institutional mechanisms. And reporting in 2027 allows us to assess readiness for the midterm review. And it gives it sufficient time to fill gaps in terms of capacity, um, data collection, and so on. 
and Costco Rec and mobilize any additional resources that might be needed. And maybe even adjust um, the scope of the report because reporting should continue um, thereafter. So in as much as we are very ambitious and we want to be able to show progress on everything, we may not have the capacity or the resources to do so. So in doing that first report, that even that um, gives us some information in terms of, okay, can we really make an attempt to report on all of these things? Should we then um, readjust our scope and focus maybe on some core and critical things um, that we do have um, data for? So anticipating um, the reporting process provides an opportunity to identify challenges, gaps, areas needing improvement. Um, preparing these reports generate valuable lessons and evidence-based information that can be used for future decision-making. So this helps ensure that when the next reporting cycle arrives, informed decisions can be made based on insights gained from the previous reports. And I believe this is something worth um, considering. So um, my other contribution is looking at um, NFP's work on the national sustainable development efforts and support for existing international and regional monitoring frameworks and how this can inform the development of the ABAS m &E framework. So one thing that has really worked for me is being both um, quote unquote SDG focal point and the national focal point for SIDS. So for example, we currently, and when I say we, I mean Trinidad and Tobago, um, working on establishing a sustainable development unit. And because I'm involved and leading in both the portfolios of work, I've been able to offer advice on how to incorporate the SIDS agenda into that institutional sorry, into that institutional frame, um, institutional structure. So in terms of drawing lessons from the Samoa pathway, having been um, in that process and been part of that um, structure, understanding what are the lessons, come, lessons learned coming um, out of that, as we now have the ABAS and we're now trying to make some headway in terms of putting institutional structures in place, I'm able to advocate and contribute towards what should be done and what are the things that we need to take um, into consideration. So I've been able to offer advice um, and also recognize that in the national context, what we had um, in place in terms when we had the Samoa pathway wasn't really fully integrated and it should have been and it wasn't widely discussed either in terms of implementation and achievement. So that was something that is a lesson learned for us. I mean, Trinidad and Tobago. So I think I think Carita was the one that was mentioning it in terms of there are people who are in it who know about it, but then the, the people who it needs um, who it impacts isn't aware of it. And I think that is something that uh, we are going to be working. Um, a little bit more on in terms of disseminating information and making sure that the awareness of um, ABAS takes place so that we can have more um, a more national um, support for the implementation of it. Um, given this, um, I've made a priority to ensure that the relevant authorities are aware of the SIDS agenda and the ABAS. So especially since it has replaced the Samoa pathway as a new program of work for SIDS. It's important to me that Trinidad and Tobago integrates this into everything that we do. So one of the key conversations I'm having at work is what, sorry, is that when I talk about SDGs, SIDS is always part of that conversation and it's always part of that discussion. Not as a separate conversation late, um, later on, but at the same time. So as we are developing systems or frameworks for monitoring and reporting on the SDGs, SIDS needs to be embedded in that process and keeping um, SIDS part of the conversation when we're talking about sustainable development is one way that um, that is being done. So we're also looking at how you can integrate SIDS into our SDG data repository online platform. And once it is up and running, how 
we include sit specific data is something that we're going to be discussing as we um, move along. So we would have received um, through the joint SDG fund, Trinidad and Tobago benefited from the UN system helping us build our SDG data repository online platform. And we're in the process of going through the the operationalization of it. So once we be able to get the funding to do the project that we want for the data compilation and getting the indicators, that was going to feed into our data repository platform. And that would allow us now to be able to generate um, data for reports. So one of the things we did discuss is that now that we have this new framework, we have to be able to now use that platform to give us both um, both data. So we're also going to look at how we can integrate SID specific um, data into that platform as well. And we're also going to include the ABAS as we prepare the voluntary national review. So we're hoping that we are going to present our next VNR in 2026. And one of the conversations I've already started having is that we need to include a chapter within our VNR report on the other. So wherever we are at that point in time in reporting is going to serve as the baseline for um, as we move forward to make an assessment. So at least we know what it is that we need um, should we be pre um, preparing a report in 2027. So ultimately, it's about understanding the local context and advising on how we move forward based on the information we gather from various meetings, workshops, and forums. So my role as NFP is to help adapt these global and regional agendas to our local needs, mobilize resources, and be an advocate for SIDS. So in my work, I aim to keep SIDS at the forefront of discussions around sustainable development and ensure it's always considered in decision making. I also believe it's important to maintain and strengthen our working relationship with the UN system. And Trinidad and Tobago has historically had a very good working relationship with our UN RC um, office. Um, and specifically the Ministry of Planning and Development, because we are the sorry, we are the line ministry for um inter international development cooperation. So I think that is a relationship to leverage in terms of getting the support that we need to move forward. So that partnership is crucial as we develop our approach to the SIDS agenda, especially as we move forward towards implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kanithia, for those really insightful words. And I think what's really interesting is you talked a lot about the processes going from a theoretical framework to something that's actually actionable. And you've used some really good examples. And um, it's a challenge for us, too, to have that on our discussion before us about how we actually want to report on SIDS and whether that means we integrate it into all the normal reporting platforms that we have. So thank you for that. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to hear from um, our first group of presenters for the session. So please join me in saying very big thank you to them uh, straight after lunch. They did really great. So uh, now I'd like to give the floor to our lead discussant, Mr. Chris Ryan, who's joining us online. Yeah, thanks, moderator, Juliet. Very nice to see you up on stage here. I, ho I hope you can hear me okay because we can hear you great now. It's a, it's a lot better than how things were this morning. So I, I trust the audio is coming through okay. Sorry, Chris. We, Chris, we couldn't hear you. Okay. What about now? Yes, yes, yes Chris, yes, go ahead. Yes, Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Yes, Okay, I'm getting a little bit of an echo. Now, it's okay when I talk. It's just an echo when you talk, but I'll, I'm, I'm going to trust it's working okay. So, yeah, th first, thank you to the presenters that have already gone ahead of me for, for this session, for providing all the background information on what's transpired so far and what's planned for the, the reporting, monitoring, and evaluation of the ABAS. Um, I don't have much time, so I'm just going to... Uh, 
give a few comments. I'm going to focus on the quantitative assessment, which is an area I was involved in for the Samoa pathway, and I'm assuming I'm going to be involved in that again for the, the ABAS. So as, as many of you know who are involved with the Samoa pathway, we didn't really have a an indicator framework in place to do the quantitative assessment until quite late in the process. So it was nearly with only two years to go that we finally had this indicator framework in place. So given we're working on this now and we should have, we have something in place early on, what I'd like to do is just raise a few possible issues on how we might do things a little bit different from what transpired for the, the Samoa pathway. And it might help hopefully address some of these issues which we saw before with that little dot diagram that uh, Tiska displayed at the end of her little presentation. So there's three three things I just want to bring up. The first is whether or not we we want to provide the opportunity for flexibility for countries to to tailor the reporting and thus the selection of indicators to their national circumstances centered around potentially a smaller core set of indicators. And this was something that was discussed a little bit in Samoa uh, in March. The, the second one is uh, the introduction of target values. So I'm not talking about the broader targets, which we'll be mapping uh, the indicators to, but the actual specific target values which countries might want to try and achieve against the indicators, similar to what countries are doing with the SDGs. We, we didn't have any target values for the Samoa pathway, but... Uh, could we look to introduce those and, and tailor them to specifically for countries? And the third is the methodology which we, we look to adopt to, to measure the progress towards achieving the, the goals of the ABAS. Uh, we had to be a little bit creative last time around for the Samoa pathway because we didn't have target values in place. But if that's the case, I mean, we could look to, to a different approach this time around. So... Each of these things over the next few months as this work develops along the lines of the timelines, which we saw a little bit earlier, I think they just need to be discussed a little bit more. And I'm going to give you a little bit more information on each of those three, because I'd be keen to hear uh, some of the act reactions from the, the countries in particular on how we might tailor some of these things. So the, the first one I mentioned, it's you know, giving countries the flexibility to, to tailor the indicator framework to their national circumstances. And the, the downside of that is obviously it, it's going to be a lot more work. We're not going to have one indicator framework. We'll probably have a different indicator framework for each country. But the upside could be very, very big. And that is we're going to be able to tell a, a far better story of progress for each country uh, that captures the key elements of national plans which aren't necessarily covered uh, by SDG indicators. So it's worth noting that currently, I'm focusing on the Pacific here, but currently a lot of the NDPs or national development plans in the Pacific don't include that many global SDG indicators. So if we develop the ABAS framework primarily on global SDG indicators, we are emitting a lot of very relevant indicators at the, the national level. So keep that in mind when you think about all those grey dots that you were looking at uh, a little bit earlier, because this is one possible way of getting a, a few more green dots up there on that chart. The other one is the introduction of target values. Uh, we didn't have target values for the Samoa pathway, but coming up with them for each country and giving countries the, the option to propose their own targets for each of the indicators. Once again, it's going to mean a lot more work, but it will make the, the progress monitoring of the, the ABAS for each country a lot more, more relevant. And the third one I just want to touch on is, as I said, the, the methodology for measuring progress. Uh, we have to be a little bit creative and just use a, a, a not a great approach for the, for the sun mile pathway because we didn't have target values in place, but uh, SCAP do have a tool called the National SDG Tracker, uh, which does the analysis for, for countries to, to show progress uh, on how they're tracking against each of, the, each of the indicators towards the SDG. And this tool could uh, easily be adapted to the, to the ABAS. So I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it there for my feedback on the, the potential monitoring of the ABAS, but I, I did get asked by Andy during the, the lunch break if I could just give a, 
a, a minute update on the, the indicator guidelines, which have been developed for the, the Pacific, if that's okay, Juliet. Um, so basically this is a, a set of guidelines which SCAP have been working on uh, with the, the Pacific community, SPC. And there's a few key objectives we're trying to achieve with these guidelines. But one of, one of the key ones is we're trying to promote the importance of tackling indicator production in a little bit more of a holistic way uh, to try and minimise the burden on countries having to report against the SDGs, having to report against for the Pacific, the 2050 strategy having to report against the Abbas, and then they've got their own national reporting priorities where the, the centrepiece should be the national development plan. So that's one key thing. We're trying to also promote the production of better indicators, especially in national planning processes. So we're, we're teaching, uh, so we, we've come up with a set of guidelines to assess the, the quality of indicators so, so countries can monitor their, their national plans a little bit better. Uh, we're also touching on you know, how countries should tackle reporting against global and regional initiatives, such as the ABAS. Now, that part of the, the guidelines is a little bit empty at the moment because we still have to have these discussions over the next few months as to what uh, countries in the Pacific need to do to report against the, the ABAS, but we will certainly update that uh, in the next uh, few months. And the other little thing, which we're also trying to encourage countries to develop their own national indicator strategy, which basically reviews their whole indicator landscape. And that's a, an option for countries to pick up if they would, would like and we'd happily work with them. So that's once again, just doing a, a big sort of overtake or a stock taken assessment of everything that's happening at the moment and seeing where things can be improved. And it's, it's, it's good timing for that, with especially in the Pacific, with the, both the EBAS and the 2050 strategy now creating these slightly extra burdens on the, the countries, trying to come up with a way in which it can be a lot more manageable. I know I've probably gone over my time, moderator, but I'll, I'll finish there. Thanks. Really good to hear from you in terms of those three key things that we should be thinking about now that we are looking at finalizing the m &E framework and how we want to look at targets and um, and what that means. So some really tangible suggestions there from you, thank you. And also thank you for your brief um, explanation of the Pacific Indicators Guidelines, which came from a question this morning in the session. And I'm sure there's resources available if other people are interested to find out more information. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our presenters, presenters for that first part of the discussion. And uh, we'll allow a few minutes now to just open it up to the floor if there's any discussions. Um, I would ask that we just limit them to two minutes. And um, for those who are, have not spoken yet, please just introduce yourself and say which agency you come from. Thank you. Ambassador. Just... Uh... A number of uh, quick questions. On the first presentation, quantitative assessment in data-driven annual report. Can can we have clarification? What are these annual reports? Where are the sources of those? Where do they come from? Second one on qualitative assessment is the SG report. Why? And can we also uh, have some clarity around the information, is it the information will come from regional, national report to frame and construct the SG report? So can we have clarification on those, please? Um, on uh, the presentation by Ms. Uh, Douglas, uh, well done. Um, I like your presentation. The question I have is on in Samoa, I think you mentioned, we, we did uh, look at guiding principles for indicators. Uh, how do you see those? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that those have been uh, taken through and perhaps uh, Tisha and uh, Anya can also uh, respond to that. But I think it's important. The, the thing that I noticed was that in the, uh, in the timetable, 
where do the inputs from countries come in? Uh, we're talking about endorsement. Uh, we're talking about uh, agreement on target, uh, et cetera. But I'm, I'm not hearing where inputs from countries uh, will come in because it, they need to come in in the framing of indicators and target and not just ask them to endorse or whatever. I don't think that that was the, the spirit behind uh, the uh, meeting in, in Samoa. And then uh, just on your 2027 uh, proposal, I think uh, one of the things that we did recognize was that there are certain areas that will require a little bit more time to get the assessment right. And therefore the timing needs to be a bit longer. So that's why we, we, we sort of look at that time frame that, that you mentioned. And I, I really liked your uh, suggestion in terms of uh, having a section in the uh, VNR on, on APES. I think that's a good uh, proposal uh, moving forward. I have other uh, one or two uh, questions about uh, the presentation by Ryan. Uh, on flexibility, you say flexible to tailor to national circumstances. I, I fully agree with that, but you're gonna, at the same time, you also advocate for the need to compare. Um, now for comparison purposes, it's gonna be extremely difficult if each countries are not using uh, similar indicators. So perhaps I think in RPA, we, we've sort of felt that perhaps in those cases, we should have core indicators. And then perhaps the specific uh, context of countries can feature uh, later on. I think I'll leave it at there uh, because I think others would want to, but I have other questions as well, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'll take uh, two more questions. I think Cuba, you have the floor. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, taking into account that this is the first time that I take the floor, I would like to thank the governor of Ontario for the warm welcome and also uh, to thank the office of the OHRLLS. It's a little bit difficult to <laughs> pronounce for the all the help in the organization of this this event. I would like to make some some comments uh, that are regarding the monitoring and evaluation uh, activities taking into account the lesson learned from Samoa Pathways and also from the implementation of other uh, div uh, sustainable development agenda. Uh, in this uh, meeting, well, nobody doubts the importance of monitoring and evaluation in order to, to be on track on the implementation of the development agenda. Uh, establish, uh, establishing effective monitoring and evaluation systems requires systematic efforts and overcoming capacity constraint. While the NNI uh, has improved over the time in SIP uh, and has clearly contributed to the follow-up of the sustainable development agenda, the results have been extraordinarily challenging due to, and this is still a problem for all the SIP, due to the data availability and the capacity to collect relevant data. This is a problem that we are facing, despite that we are advancing. So uh, the, and also the, the data landscape are highly uneven between the cities. Country with rel relatively major economies have more resources to invest in national level data collection and management than uh, most of smaller economies where the public, where the public administration has limited human and financial resources. There, therefore, it's important to ensure that the evaluation activities take into account, and this is something that was mentioned, take into account the unique situation of each country. Here, not one size fit, fits all. We have to take into account the particular institutional arrangement, the, the organization of the government, the cultural system, 
the priority of each country in order to uh, establish the monitoring and evaluation system. Also, it's very important to promote the country-led monitoring evaluation will be, that will be uh, best served to the need of the country to manage sustainable development. Sometimes we, we look at the evaluation uh, activity as has to come from outside. So we need to, to, to realize that this is something that we have to own it as, as a country. Uh, and also the all the requirements of for the national level capacity building need to be also carefully incorporating in the development of the overall regional monitoring and evaluation framework. This would include providing substantial financial resources over a period of time, given the low starting point in many countries. I have a question and taking into account that was explained and this is a process that we are going, we just start kicking off, uh, kicking on. How can, how can evaluation support for various external uh, founding uh, founders be, be brought together because this is dispersed. So there is evaluation support from different agency, but it's very dispersed. And I think that we need uh, to bring in a coherent package you know, from, his, uh, from his current fragmentation in order to help and in order to better use the the resources in a more efficient way. I think that this is, is, is very important. Uh, and also that uh, I think that we need to work together is to increase the cr cross learning between each other. This is also very important. Uh, there is existing mechanism that could be used for this pur purpose, including, for example, AOSIS, the interagency consultative group on seats, uh, and we can bring also together CARICOM in the Caribbean, OECS, and other other organizations together. But I think that we need to to work, continue to work in a more coherent way in order to better use the the resource that sometimes are not are not available or are not there in the moment that we need it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe we'll allow some time for our panelists to uh, to give some feedback to some of those questions and comments raised. Uh, maybe I'll start on this side with Tishka and Anya. Um, thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, I will start with responding to um, Amb Ambassador Lutheru's question around the two uh, reports um, that will now be coming um, out of out of Abbas. So, so the first, um, which will be released in time for HLPF, uh, is going to be your, your quantitative type of report, similar to what you see coming out, as I said, um, for the, the annual SDG progress report, it's going to be along those kinds of lines in terms of a, a, a statistical report, which is going to be led, um, drafted, uh, led by our regional commissions um, for that for that process in the same way that that um, they did for the statistical report that we produced for this this Samoa pathway. That's where that dot table came from. And, and that's what Chris alluded to in terms of the challenges that they had, the commissions had in putting together that report. So that one will be released in time for HLPF and that will inform how we craft and, and the discussions that that go into the into the SID session because the um, Abbas resolution, if I'm not mistaken, talks about repurposing the SID session to more closely track to the HLPF as opposed to uh, the, the sort of more policy oriented type of approach that we've been taking to the SID session. And then the, the other report is your is the usual um, SG's, SG's report, and that is where the more qualitative assessment, um, for want of a better set of words, is going to happen. Um, now, that report is typically um, as you know, Ambassador, the inputs for that come from the UN system. They come from member states. If member states feel like reporting, over the years we have really not gotten a lot of inputs from member states. Most of the inputs from um, for that report has come from the UN system and from our development partners um, as well when they feel like reporting. Um, so so that that particular report will remain and that's where you'll see the types of programs and, and the money that has been spent and it will also cover some of the other mandates um, 
that we are often called upon to re report. So if there's something on partnerships or the global business network, those kinds of things, that will go into that report, while the other one is, is more of a statistical um, uh, publication. Uh, so I hope that answers your question, Ambassador. Did I? Okay. Okay. Um, and then I want to strongly agree with the comments um, that Cuba made in terms of, 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 of the challenges. Um, I want to, we have some MCOs in the room, um, the, the, which we can put them on the hot seat and talk about the, the need to drive coherence with, with some of the support that's needed um, to strengthen statistical systems and, and monitoring at, at, at the national level and perhaps our, our, our MCOs and RC's offices um, can take the floor and talk about how they can assist or what they have been attempting to do um, within within better than than us who are headquarter based um, um, can can sort of deal with. So I'll stop there, Madam Moderator. Wish there's more. Um, nothing much to add there. Um, you covered the issues, Anya. Um, just to speak a bit on the resource mobilization um, piece. Uh, we understand um, the challenges there very much. I think for the last maybe three to five years in, this, in the margins of the Statistical Commission, we've been having meetings around that very issue um, with Paris 21 um, taking the lead on um, uh, sensitizing um, partners on the need for uh, resource mobilization for the SIDS in terms of their data capacities and and, produce, and data collection. Um, so we will continue to work there. That might be one of the um, key takeaways of this meeting. Um, Kinesia, uh, uh, we can further discuss that as well, um, how we can take that forward to ensure that um, we have frameworks for resource mobilization for this, this, um, this type of work. Thanks. Thank you. I'd like to give the um, chance to Ms. Douglas to just respond to the question that came from the ambassador. And then um, I might also ask Chris after that, if you heard the question that came in about the um, data, if you could just give us a bit more um, clarity around that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Moderator. I think I may put Damien on this spot because <laughs> he was at the um, session we had in Samoa, and I remember that we did develop the guiding principles that Ambassador referred to. Um, I guess the question would be to what extent those guiding principles were shared with the interagency task force for um, incorporating into their work and into their terms of reference. Because to a certain extent in Christopher's presentation, he did mention some of the things coming out of that meeting in terms of being flexible and adaptable um, in terms of national um, and in terms of sort of national and regional um, context. And so some of those elements were brought out in his presentation, but the ex the extent to which what was um, documented in some was shared with the interagency task force, I think, um, OHR, LOS, DESA. <laughs> May have to respond respond to that because, um, yes, I would leave that there. Um, in terms of the other question, I mean, um, Ambassador, I hear you in terms of the time frame and understanding that there are certain things that are going to take longer to um, produce and I just I mean I guess within myself I feel like at least do something so that you can know where you are and in my mind the things that you feel within as a country I mean that you feel you're unable to um, produce reports and that's something that you don't attempt because you need more time to be able to put structures in place for reporting. But I don't think that because the things that would take longer um, that need more time should prevent you from at least doing some sort of assessment um, at a certain point in time to be able to identify where you are, what is needed, because I think um, in as much as we have data that um, Anya would have presented that is two years old, we still need something for where we are now 
so that when we have any conversation about resources, I mean, we have any conversation about um, what is needed, we're doing it based on the situation that is current and as is. So, so where are we now? Um, where are we by time the um, framework is ready and we have to start looking at um, reporting where are we, what do we need, um, what is available. And, and I think that um, that should inform the conversation going forward. And if we are able to, once the framework is up and running, start putting things in place and we're able to um, prepare a report um, to see where we are before, at least sufficient enough time before the midterm review, there are things that we can then put in place to, uh, I guess, give us a better footing for halfway there, where are we, and the um, assessment is, at least it takes into consideration um, attempts to put in place to, to, um, to correct things. Thank you. Um, and I am conscious of our time, but I do recall there was one point that was made also by the ambassador around indicators being flexible, but also the need to have comparability across different formats and how that would actually translate and be practical for SIDS countries. So Chris, in 30 seconds or less, um, did you want to weigh in on that? Keeping in mind that we also, session two is going to continue after afternoon tea. So. Yeah, thank, thanks, Juliet. Now, I, I mean, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, to Ambassador, I mean, your your interpretation of the discussion in yeah, March in Samoa is exactly, exactly the same as, as mine. I mean, we we did we're certainly encouraging some flexibility, but we we we've got to have a core set. We can't let countries just come up with whatever set of indicators they want. So, so want to come up with that sort of compromise is the work that I think needs to be done over the the coming months. So, how big? might that core set look like and sort of what uh, additions or modifications country might want to make to it is the, the challenge ahead. But it's, I'm interpreting things exactly as you did in, in March, Mr. Ambassador. After, 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 break, after, after. come back and we'll have an opportunity to have um, some more discussion together. So on that note, thank you very much to all our lovely panelists today and our interventions. Chris. Welcome back, distinguished participants. We've reached the last section for segment two. Thank you. So we're moving into our second session. Um, sorry, our second segment of session two. And uh, this is quite an exciting one because we'll be talking to a lot of our partners here where they'll be sharing some insights on best practice um, and best practices around m and &E processes, what they're doing in their own respective agencies and countries, and also um, what they're doing in terms of how they get support through the UN system and with other stakeholders. So um, sit back and relax. We have an excellent panel of speakers who will be sharing these best, best practices with us. Um, so yes, without further ado, I will introduce our speakers. So firstly, we have Miss Aisa Fusadi, Deputy Director General from the Ministry of Housing, uh, Land and Urban Development from the Maldives. And then we have Ms. Karita White, who's our Deputy Permanent Res Representative from Barbados to the UN. So thank you. We'll start with you, Ms. Salah. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, Um, I would try not to repeat most of the things that we have talked about, but uh, I would uh, emphasize on uh, hopefully some things that we have not touched upon. And uh, yeah. right, right. Firstly, uh, I will have a look at like why we need. Uh, monitoring and evaluation. So um, ideally to track changes, we have come up with a 
where we have discussed like how we are going to measure against each other. But I feel that uh, the most important part of uh, monitoring and evaluation is to know what, how uh, we are progressing and uh, what we need to change if we are not progressing. And uh, we really need to be mindful about data-driven decisions and how we can use data and information for making timely interventions and also alignment with global global standards uh, where we have the metadata that uh, would be uh, reflected uh, with, uh, with the global uh, standards so that the comparisons can be made. And uh, I think we really need to have the, we are talking about localizing and uh, uh, giving leverage to indicators uh, for the countries, but I think we really uh, need to make them realistic and uh, reflecting of the local realities that uh, we as seeds faced. And also along the way, I feel that we there would be need to make adjustments to it as well. And uh, also we've talked about duplication and how uh, monitoring could uh, 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 assist with the resource efficiency and of course transparency and, and uh, accountability comes in. And also the local capacity development. I think this is the biggest uh, challenge uh, the most seed countries face. And uh, this, um, these mechanisms and things that we really need to focus if we want to realize uh, uh, what we are aiming for. And also um, inclusion of marginalized groups so that we could consciously include and make things inclusive as uh, Abbas uh, states. And uh, looking at, uh, oh, sorry, I got a bit carried away. Um, and looking at how uh, we could have a more effective uh, um, monitoring system, I think we really need to have clear roles on who is doing what. I'm sitting here and thinking like how the statistical systems or statistical officers are going to be in integrated in this dialogue and when th are they coming in uh, and how do we liaise at the local level and the regional level? Like we really need to work together with them when we are finalizing uh, things. And uh, also how we have to integrate technology into uh, what we are doing. And uh, we really need to uh, have broader consultations and engagements. We've to already talked about the private sector and the civil society engagements and uh, integrating into national frameworks and having flexibility to adapt to local context. And we've already discussed these things, but I'm still wondering how we will be actually doing it and what the leverage uh, we will be having uh, into doing it. But, and, um, and uh, the alignment with the reporting framework, I can't stress enough on this point because I really don't want uh, it to be a burden, additional burden for the countries. Uh, and uh, also integrating ABAS into national plans as we talked about earlier in the session as well. And uh, we in the Maldives is uh, at the moment planning for a longer term development plan. So this would definitely be uh, a key, uh, Abbas would be a key uh, uh, integrated into it, uh, definitely. And also we need to make a provision for future uh, development goals that might be coming in. As you know, after 2030, we probably have a new global uh, goal. So how we could include that or how we could adapt to uh, these, uh, we really need to focus on. And uh, we really uh, need to make it uh, seed-centric focus as well. Like we've talked about, we are the same, but we are different as well. So how we could really focus on the seed, the, the issues that affect seeds we really need to weave in into the uh, framework and uh, how we could use the existing data so that the countries are not overburdened with reporting uh, as well. And uh, I 
I really uh, feel that we need to have regular consultations. So at given points, we really need to um, uh, get stakeholders involved and uh, gather feedback and how uh, and understand how relevant uh, some of the issues are for the time being. Uh, um, and looking at uh, partnerships, we really need to understand that the governments alone cannot be doing this, and we really need to have broader consultations. And we have talked about uh, how uh, regional um, bodies like ESCAP and CARICOM has, uh, can be facilitating this, and how uh, the UN systems can be uh, providing technical support. And development partners, other development partners need to come in uh, to uh, carry this forward. And also uh, private sector contributions, and especially for data gathering, where we have uh, in, in the Maldives, some uh, data is gathered by uh, CSOs, uh, like uh, through their health screening. Uh, so how we can in, in integrate these data into formal mechanisms, uh, we really need to understand and uh, find a way forward. And we, we have to be open for innovation and uh, technology where we really have to think about uh, things like big data and drone technology that we are in the Maldives trying to uh, incorporate into the formal uh, uh, statistical systems. Uh, when we're talking about a main, uh, mainstreaming with reporting, we really have to um, uh, uh, talk about the national uh, reporting and existing framework and also coordinate with development partners and uh, strengthen na national capacity and management of data. So I find that like, this would be an opportunity for us to build our capacity uh, for better data management and using data to for decision making. And I think that is something that we really have to consciously um, uh, get ourselves to do. Uh, and uh, I would, for that, I think the UN system needs to recognize to use the national uh, statistical agencies data in their reporting. So it gets weights and uh, it uh, it's given importance and uh, and also this would be we could uh, leverage this uh, capacity building for better data management as an accelerator for the country's development not only just to report on the mandatory uh, SDGs or the bus or something, but really uh, to make timely interventions that the country needs uh, to focus on. And uh, looking at the way forward, um, I will uh, um, I will not repeat the things that we have discussed already, but uh, I would like to highlight that um, it it needs to align with the national development goals, and we have had some uh, good examples uh, here already discussed. And fostering collaboration that is also some. Uh, theme that has already come up in their decisions and uh, strengthening the national capacities and also mobilizing resources for really making this Abbas uh, a reality for the six countries and uh, fostering uh, uh, and ensuring that to for this document to be relevant in the future, we, we really need to ensure that uh, we have room for flexibility or leverage that we, along the way, when we move forward, we really need to um, accommodate the emerging challenges or, uh, uh, or things that uh, we live in a world that things change uh, rapidly. So we really need to make that uh, uh, in keep in mind. And also, I think for the next, next steps, we really need to make a clear roadmap of who is doing what, and uh, also thinking in short term as well as long term, and uh, coordination mechanisms, both uh, nationally and uh, across uh, the region and uh, at the global level as well. And I really feel that what would help is start with pilots and then scale up to some things that we are unsure. Uh, that uh, with the feedback, we could always scale up and then uh, 
uh, have uh, different stages of how we could proceed with it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. I can turn to Ms. White. Um, so good afternoon again, <laughs> colleagues. Um, so I will now um, just add what I can to the wonderful presenters who went before me on sharing best practices in cooperation with the UN and monitoring and evaluation processes. So um, I'll just highlight, uh, what is it now, five topics for you. Um, the first one would be the importance of a monitoring and evaluation framework. Um, the second one would be challenges. The third one would be building on building a new monitoring and evaluation framework. The fourth would be how we move forward together. And the fifth would be conclusion. So the importance of an M&E framework. So here we see um, one of the lessons learned from the Samoa pathway is the need to integrate monitoring and evaluation into the framework as early as possible. So many persons before um, in this session, as well as um, this morning, spoke about um, that being one of the shortfalls, if you want to say that, of the Samoa pathway. Um, without a monitoring and evaluation framework, implementation becomes fragmented. The framework becomes almost like a tree that doesn't bear fruit. And with the Samoa pathway, the monitoring and evaluation framework was developed in 2001, and it was revised and strengthened in 2000, um, 2023. And we are course correcting with the ABAS. So on the importance of the m and &E framework, ABAS requires an implementation framework, m and &E essential for tracking progress, and it works best when included in the framework as early as possible. We move then to challenges. Um, so for Barbados, one of the challenges we faced, which led to gaps in coordination at the national level for monitoring and evaluation, was linked to the late start of the m and &E framework for the Samoa pathway. Additionally, human resource capacity to analyze data and information um, and feed them into reporting processes was another constraint um, which we identified, which was also uh, reflected in the ECLAC regional report that I mentioned earlier today um, of December 2023 on the topic. The ECLAC report also identifies the need for streamlined reporting structures to uh, improve efficiency. Moving then to building a new M&E framework. So we see it's developed, one that needs to be developed in consultation with AOSIS SIDS for buy-in from all SIDS. Um, there needs to be a clear scope and one that's adaptable and um, adaptable and focuses on simple measurable indicators. So this is something that we would have heard the UN system talk about. We've also heard others talk about when they're making their comments. Um, and we thank the work already that's underway by the IATF and look forward to continued collaboration. And I know Tishka in her presentation said that they would be meeting with uh, AOSIS um, sometime before the end of the year. So we do look forward to that ongoing collaboration. Then looking at the 11 step harmonization. Um, so this is coming out of the meeting that you would have heard about that was held in March um, this year on the topic ahead of the adoption of the ABAS and you would have we would have all identified key points which ultimately formed the guidelines of the 11 point approach to guide the ABAS m &E framework and the first one is that it must reflect SID's unique context and allow for flexibility. Um, the second one is that it should prioritize simplicity and build on data systems already in place. 
Uh, so the main points would be map existing frameworks and identify overlaps, engage stakeholders in harmonization priorities, and promote cross-sectoral collaboration and capacity building. How then do we move forward together? Um, so as we move forward with the implementation and monitoring and evaluation of the Abbas, we must ensure that we improve and build on lessons learned. We're doing that now with the IATF and the establishment of the m &E framework for SIDS and by SIDS. There are also some SIDS, SIDS cooperation initiatives built into the Abbas, which can help with our m &E goals. And these include, um, like I would have mentioned this morning, the Blue Green Knowledge Transfer Hub, um, and that will support implementation through the facilitation of one, information exchange and SID SIDS cooperation, including cooperation um, with SIDS on blue green economy, education, as well as training and exchange of best practices as solutions to share blue green economic challenges. Two, it can serve as a regional and international information and communication technology platform and information dissemination hub for SIDS, and also the SIDS Center of Excellence that I know we're all excited and eager to hear from Antigua and Barbuda about tomorrow, no pressure, um, will also um, serve as one of the main prongs of uh, the Abbas, which talks about the SIDS Global Data Hub, which will be a key component for um, and for the m and &E within the Abbas. And so to then wrap up conclusion, we're building on the lessons learned um, from the Samoa pathway. We're not um, reinventing or starting anything from scratch. And we're also then moving forward with devel developing a SID specific m and &E framework uh, early. And this is already underway and we won't be, I think it was about almost six years into Samoa pathway, um, which is something that we've definitely, definitely learned from. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you to our two presenters. Um, you know, it's interesting that you both sort of covered different aspects of the same theme, but some of the things that you discussed were very much interrelated. And just to pick up on a point that Ms. Sara uh, raised in your presentation was around flexibility and the need to not overburden. And that also kind of echoes what Ms. White was saying about the um, not reinventing the wheel, looking at the lessons learned, and it's really important to bring that forward as we go into the Abbas and developing this framework further. So thank you to both of you. Um, we have some time now, and I'm very pleased that we're moving on to the lead discussants uh, section, and we will begin with Mr. Agaswandi, Senior Peace and Development Advisor, UNMCO, Fiji. Thank you, sir. Is working yeah thanks um thank you colleagues and uh, really uh thanks to Vanuatu for hosting us and uh, really wonderful to be back here for many of us who've been visiting this country wonderful um and, and um, one of the most uh, beautiful places in the pacific for those who are visiting the region for the first time um i'm bringing the perspective from the um, uh, rc office uh, based in fiji that covering five countries, so probably same like some other colleagues from Caribbean. Uh, so, and I've been taking a lot of notes since the, the, the morning and a lot of things that I'm about to say actually have already been said, but I, let me say it, um, few things that are probably useful. Look, we take um, in the RC office that, um, that really um, uh, have that mandate to support the SDG, we take this data issue very seriously. And um, and we try to incorporate this in the in 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 our attempt to really support the region. And um, we have, uh, I think, colleagues uh, in the morning presented um, a regional cooperation framework uh, for the UN that work for the, across the Pacific region. We really try to use this regional framework based on the available availability of data that we have. But that is at the regional level. There is a the more important part, which is at the country level. We have what we call the country implementation plan, and and to 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 uh, 
to really um, uh, come up with uh, this uh, realistic, um, up-to-date country implementation plan, we rely on the country analysis, the CCA. And again, the data is very important for us. Um, so we try to capture uh, to the extent possible the most updated uh, data here. And then on the top of that, we have a structure. We try to establish this. I'm not sure whether uh, for other uh, RC office in the Pacific region or other places, we have what we call joint steering committee, where every country, the UN agencies, the government, um, uh, and the, that's mean not only uh, uh, central government, but also the various department uh, come together to really look at the achievement, what we try to do in each country. And the data, again, is the basis, should be the basis for that discussion. A lot of things uh, have to be Im improved. But this, that is what we try to do. And then um, any, any initiative that the UN try to propose, again, the question is the data uh, that can back up. But currently, on, on, let's say, for example, on Vanuatu, we work on renewable solution. I am here and some colleagues who work on we, we, the first question we, we, re, we put forward is what is the data on displacement, um, uh, uh, climate, uh, climate displacement uh, in Vanuatu. That is the basis of, of our work. So it's a lot, it's very, very important. I do have to uh, put my head away a little bit from the RC office. It is a challenge. I mean, we talked, I'm, I'm talking to colleagues uh, from Vanuatu working on the data on Solomon Islands. If you look, and uh, I'm really grateful to the recognition of the need to support this country, the need to support the country level data uh, issue. I think we talk, everyone recognizes this. All the, in, in the region, this is uh, on the, the top agenda that we need to improve the data. But then the practice is, where is the resources? Unfortunately, we don't have resources. We don't have a lot of resources. It is not, when we, everyone talk about uh, resources for development finance um, for the Pacific and some many, many of this country, Tech Ministry of Planning or Solomon Islands is probably in the, the lowest in the consideration of the budget when every year when the government uh, budget uh, this. No criticism. I know, I mean, when you have to face between um, in health services, uh, education services or paying the salary of the teacher, uh, uh, of course, this is secondary uh, priority. So as Vanuatu, so as many others. So we are facing this challenge. And then this is the region where the data has to be constantly updated. We actually, you are coming at the right time of the year. Soon we are entering the cyclone season. When cyclone happens, we on average now, we have about cut three, cut four, many, many cases now cut five. You category, uh, sorry, four and five, that means you, you will see 40% uh, to, to quote some of the Ministry of Finance figures in some country, GDP being wet out. That means also require new analysis. The data need to be constantly, um, is it, I think, uh, uh, sir, you as a Ministry of Anuatu, every year you have to reconsider your data, right? Because of, because of that, I mean, so where is the resources to support that? So it is very, very uh, challenging. And then it is the work that I think is very, very important. And for me today, also learning about um, the, the the national focal point, uh, I think I was talking also to the uh, head of ESCAP. Look, um, and uh, the ABBAS agenda is really probably an abstract to general public still. Uh, into, into of the the big term of Abbas, right? But the detail of that is really matters. And this is probably the issue where the national focal point that try to build the coherence of this and the coordination of this probably could take that that uh, that lead to, because when you look at the Abbas agenda, this is for the Pacific region, is is about life and death. This is about surviving. It's about, uh, about environmental protection and planetary sustainability. For us, this is not, an abstraction, right? So it's really, um, uh, I, from, I mean, coming here, also learning a lot from, from you guys, from everyone here, I would recommend, I think, 
which should be every year probably there's an effort in our region and probably our office the UN also can can do this uh, to support how every year we can sit together to look at this uh, on the data issue on the achievement of the ABAS and SDG overall I will end here as a as a comment thank you Maybe the microphone is echoing everybody's energy levels as we come to the end of the day. Thank you, Mr. Wadi. I'd like to ask Ms. Sasha Jatan Singh, the loss and damage expert, climate analytics. The floor, madam. Thank you. Should be on. And um, I just want to say thank you to the government of Vanuatu for hosting this um this meeting and to the UN OHRLLS um, team for organizing it. And um, this is my second time in the Pacific and I always feel like I'm home <laughs> when I'm here. Um, Cause it's, you know, it, it just feels like I'm home in the Caribbean. So there's a lot that we share that we don't recognize even though we're in two different oceans basically. Um, and I have, heard a, you know a lot of the challenges that SIDS are facing in the regions related to capacity to data needs um to resource needs as well and I just want to highlight the importance of incorporating civil society to uh, you know support implementation and monitoring of the um you know the SDG process as well and also the Abbas pro process so so this um, comment is based on the experience of, um, of civil society in Trinidad and Tobago in participating in our um, VNR process. And we, Trinidad and Tobago had to submit and we submitted our voluntary national um, report on the SDGs in 2020, so during COVID. And, um, and at the time I was working at with the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, Canary, um, and we were part of the SDGs Catalyst Network, which was a network of 21 leading CSOs in Trinidad and Tobago. And, um, and this Catalyst ne Network helped to mobilize CSOs in Trinidad and Tobago to deliver and to develop a landmark civil society shadow report on our country's progress in implementing S SDG 13 on climate change. And um, just a little bit about the SDGs Catalyst Network. It was established under a, an EU funded CSOs for Good Governance project. And the, the aim of this um, network is to work in partnership with government and other stakeholders and to help break down you know, traditional sectoral silos and also to demonstrate how civil society can work together through integrated thinking and action in enabling and supporting sustainable development priorities. So this shadow report, you know, it it was started, you know, right before COVID. It was completed during COVID. And um, it included inputs from about 53 civil society organizations working across the SDGs and in different sectors. And the report actually provided direct inputs into the um, VNR on the progress of implementing the SDGs, um, which was, you know, presented at the HLPF um, in July 2020. And the participating CSOs engaged in a cross-cutting analysis of climate change in five key thematic areas, um, which included gender and equality, sustainable cities and communities, energy and responsible consumption and production, biodiversity um, and health, water and food security. And the result of this was a scorecard of about 30 priorities to accelerate climate action, including a ranking of the level of progress in achieving them as assessed by civil society in Trinidad and Tobago. And I think what's important is that, you know, TNT's um, VNR process was actually an opportunity for civil society to develop this sort of, of um, shadow report to ensure that 
the perspectives from civil society were being captured and that our voices were heard in implementing and monitoring the SDGs, specifically, you know, um, SDG 13 at the national level. So coming out of this um, process, we could see that this, um, you know, this civil society led process for developing the shadow report could be considered a good practice um, and a potential model for more meaningful civil society engagement in sustainable development processes, including in how we go about implementing and tracking the progress of the ABAS. Um, because it's a way to, you know, it's a way to showcase how civil society could be a strong partner to governments for a whole of society approach to implementing and tracking progress on sustainable development actions. Um, so it's a way to, to include civil society more holistically in the Abbas pro, you know, process, um, noting that we do have you know, data gaps, we do have capacity constraints, we do have resource constraints, but it's how can you harness the power of civil society to be able to provide those perspectives, those views, and those those inputs which could help to inform um this sort of um monitoring framework um and how we we track this e framework for the abbas moving forward in 10 years so i think it was a, a quite a useful experience for the cso's involved in this process it also really helped to highlight and to to raise awareness of the SDGs and and to raise awareness of the um of Trinidad and Tobago's um our our national development plan um the twenty thirty vision twenty thirty to to civil society and to the wider population as well because instead of it being just a you know this international level or government level process it was now more accessible to to the public and to civil society to actually participate and contribute to to uh, you know this sustainable development process so they weren't removed from it so i think it's something that can be utilized or harnessed um, as we move forward in in um, how we're going to track and monitor the progress on the abbas over the next 10 years nine and a half years thank you Thank you very much. And that takes us to our finally discussant uh, participant, Ms. Emily Wilkinson from ODI Resi Project. Ms. Wilkinson, you have the floor joining us from online. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Thank you. Do we have volume? Can you hear me? Thank you, Emily. Go ahead. We can hear you loud and clear. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me to provide some reflections at your meeting today. I'm sorry, I can't be there with you in Vanuatu. Um, thanks to all the speakers and discussants so far. This sounds like a very valuable conversation. Um, just to say a few words about the Resilient and Sustainable Islands Initiative, RESI. Uh, we're a global advisory network with about 100 affiliates. Um, across SIDS and um, other countries uh, around the world, working at the international level to support SIDS to overcome constraints to achieving financial sustainability, equitable societies, environmental justice, and international alliances. Um, so in, in order to do that and to think about how uh, RESI could be useful, we had to formulate view on what those constraints 
uh, are and how change happens. Um, and that helps, I think, with um, thinking about the task of um, of uh, creating ABAS goals and targets and indicators. So we really need, do need to think about how change occurs and what the what how to overcome constraints and how the global context shapes progress. Um, I've been working for years on resilience theory and metrics like measuring risk, vulnerability, adaptive capacities, impacts, loss and damage. Um, so basically how economies and societies can progress on sustainable development goals in the context of um, more frequent, intense, and also more complex and systemic shocks. Um, and I've been to a load of workshops and read a lot of reports and papers about resilience and uh, resilient development. I've been involved in designing resilience um, and uh, resilient development metrics. And one thing that all uh, researchers and academics agree on is that it's really really difficult measuring resilience and progress towards becoming more resilient is complex and difficult so i wanted just to speak a bit from my experience um practical experience of working with the government of dominica on their climate resilience and recovery plan because we did develop an me framework and i think doing that helped me to think about how we could make it a little bit simpler um, because it, it is very complex to to try and uh, measure um, changes, which um, you perhaps only get a sense of when there is a shock, and that makes it very very difficult to know if progress has been made. So, one of the things that I wanted to say about the the ABAS and really any um, developing any M and E framework is that it's you need to start with the overall goals. So the ABAS has some categories. Um, of sort of high level goals, but those need to be more specific. Um, so for example, resilient economies, what, what does that mean? What does a resilient econ economy look like and how will you measure that? Similarly with um, safe, healthy and prosperous societies, what would that look like by 2030? We have some already, some um, goals around biodiversity that would work well for the environmental protection and planetary uh, sustainability um, uh, goal of the ABAS. So we already have the Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, but we need to select specific uh, goals and targets that are appropriate to SIDS. So I think that's, that's the first point. And with the Climate Resilience and Recovery Plan in Dominica, um, the overall goal of um, a resilient Dominica was broken down into three um, more sort of specific areas. One was to have a stronger overall socioeconomic development trajectory. Um, so looking at um, uh, economic growth and how that can be sustained over time. The second was reducing impact from climate and other environmental shocks. Um, so measuring those impacts when they happened. And third was reducing the time to recover from uh, climate and other environmental shocks. So looking at recovery rates and um, time to restore basic services. So you can see already that the overall goal of like a resilient Dominica, you can already begin to break it down into sort of sub components. Um, and then from there, uh, a number of um, sectors were identified um, that were um, believed to be important contributions to those outcomes. So, um, uh, protecting sustainably, leveraging natural uh, resources, strengthened institutional systems, strong communities, a robust economy, and well-planned and durable infrastructure. So those were all sort of pillars of the overall resilience um, outcome. The other thing I wanted to just comment on, um, which um, I think it will be important to uh, developing the m &E framework, is to have a, a story or a credible theory of change of how interventions lead to outcomes. So once we have the more specific outcomes about resilient economies uh, and a secure future and so on, um, thinking about uh, what the actions are that lead to those outcomes is what we mean by a theory of change. And you may have already discussed this and apologies if you have, um, but for developing a theory of change, uh, you need to, identify what are those actions that are going to contribute to the outcomes, who needs to contribute. So the balance between SIDS ownership, uh, 
um, but also requests, uh, a very specific uh, request from the international community, um, as outlined in the Abbas, um, and what those, uh, when those requests are needed, so sort of timeline, I guess not everything is uh, required all at once. Then, but then also, what's the baseline? What do we know about the current situation um, and how uh, how far away from those goals by uh, 2034, how far away are we at the moment? And then finally, and really importantly for that theory of change, what are the assumptions about, for example, the current global uh, economic context that are going to affect achieving those goals? Um, and those might change over time, but um, clearly, um, SIDS are affected by international issues, so not just the how well the economy is doing, um, but other shocks, um, geopolitical changes, all of these things will affect um, the progress that um, individual uh, uh, SIDS can make towards um, the, the overall outcomes of the ABBAS. I think, so for that, it's really important to be specific, the kinds of support measures that are needed to build economic resilience, scale up climate action, build disaster resilience, strengthen health systems, all of those things. It would be great to have very clear um, targets and indicators for so that the ABAS can also improve accountability. And I think that's one thing that would be um, a you know, hugely um, a huge improvement on previous monitoring and evaluation frameworks and SIDS um, uh, decades to actually have an m &E framework that then promotes action and holds different actors accountable to how they are delivering on the ABAS. So there's a great opportunity here. It would be really excited to see um, a, a strong accountability mechanism and uh, an ability to track the actions of different stakeholders as they contribute to the overall ABAS outcomes. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. Now the floor is open for a few minutes for discussion time. So um, we will take questions or comments. Please try to keep them as succinct and brief as possible, maybe two minutes or less. Um, and we've got people walking around with a roving microphone. Thank you, Mauritius, you have the floor. So let me start by thanking our presenters. Um, we've been talking a lot about uh, the m and &E framework. But um, we all know that any framework that needs to be fed would be as good as the people or the institution that need to feed them. And here I'm talking about the capacity of people and institution. And um, in my own presentation, I did speak uh, to this issue uh, when it came to our second Vienna. In fact, it's second, not the first. So even under our second Vienna, we are still facing difficulties about uh, data collection and analysis. So I, I was wondering uh, whether um, in the discussions uh, to um, come up with uh, the m and &E framework, whether um, some thought have, uh, would have gone into capacity building. Are we going to do that in parallel? Are we going to do that after the framework has been um, established, um, then uh, if, if it's a second case, we might be uh, you know, uh, uh, lagging behind if we wait for another six, seven months and then talk about it. So um, that, that is um, something that we should uh, reflect and act on. Um, and I think uh, I, I would I would add my voice to what uh, Ambassador and uh, Chair of AOZ uh, said about um, flexibility, but not uh, flexibility uh, beyond a certain point. Uh, and here um, we've spoken of harmonization in, in in one context, but then harmonization here is also important. To to me. Um, if we if we don't have some standards 
um, a way of, of, of collecting and analyzing data, how would we know that I should go to Vanuatu or Solomon for um, learning from their best practices? So uh, I think that's, that's very important. And it would eventually also become important when we have to engage with our development partners. If we allow to allow for too much of flexibility, we might not, uh, we might end up being not being, um, you know, on equal footing uh, when it comes to um, uh, engaging, eng engaging with our development partners. And, and the last one is how many frameworks we do after that, monitor, analyze, evaluate, and what next? What next? Um, so I was wondering uh, whether this ME is only for us seeds, or we'll have something that would also allow us to evaluate how far and how much our partners have been involved. I think that is an important element that we should uh, bring in, if uh, not yet. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, now, a couple more questions from here, UNMCO Barbados. And then from PIFS, before we allow our panelists to make some reflection on comments. Thank you, uh, moderator. Um, so just wanted to come in to complement some of the comments made by my colleague from the coordination system. Uh, who spoke earlier, but before doing so, perhaps a, a reflection. Um, I think the overall capacity of countries of the SIDS to evaluate and to monitor development programming and development effectiveness is perhaps where this conversation needs to be anchored. Um, what is clear is that um, if you look at many of the countries, at least those that I cover in the Eastern Caribbean, the overall um, evaluation or lack of evaluation policies, for example, is a huge deficit um, that I think has to be addressed. And I think part of the as we work with the national focal points, the CIS focal points, I think bringing awareness to, to that. The independence of the evaluation function, for example, independence of national statistical offices, for example, are some uh, fundamental issues which affect the ability uh, to really um, you know, generate the kind of evidence base that is necessary for informing development planning and development programming across countries. So I think that's part of the reality that we have to grapple with. And I certainly believe that the investments that are necessary um, for strengthening evaluation, strengthening, and I'm deliberately juxtaposing evaluation and, and, and data and statistics, because I think certainly for evaluations to be rigorous, they have to be based on, on good evidence and good data. So I think we have to put this in that context. So that's the sort of a broader uh, point I wanted to make, comment I want to make, and perhaps national focal points, CIS focal points should um, be advocating for this in the discussions at the national level and in terms of making the case. Um, the UN system, and I remember my colleague Anya put me a little bit on the spot in terms of the question from um, our distinguished colleague from Cuba. The national, the uh, UN system is really making a, um, a good effort, I believe, to support countries on this agenda. Um, and to the point made by um, the uh, distinguished rep from Cuba, I think the coherence of reporting is something that we've been trying to address. At the national level, through country implementation plans, we have been looking at ways to sort of streamline the reporting from um, agencies, funds, and programs, but that's more internal, but also supporting governments using country implementation plans 
to to systematize and uh, improve the regularity of the reporting so we have this un info platform some of you are, might be aware of it and if national focal points are not aware of the un info platform it's something you should be um, aware of because there's a lot quite a lot of data on support being provided at a national level from un from the un system that is available in this platform. So this is something that was designed by the UN system, is publicly available and can be accessed. And you can actually find quite a bit of uh, information on what agencies, funds, and programs. And that's part of the effort to ensure that you have the information that you need on, on how um, agencies, funds, and programs. In the case of the Eastern Caribbean, for example, one specific initiative that the system is taking is really um, under the leadership of UNICEF and UNFPA looking at the data gaps in the Caribbean is um, developing a joint program specifically to strengthen national statistical capacities, uh, looking at everything from legislative gaps or legislative deficits all the way down to capacity needed within institutions, within statistical offices and so on um, to support those gaps. Uh, so, so there's a lot happening, um, but the agenda um, is much broader than what's happening, and the needs are certainly much more extensive than what's what's happening on the ground. Um, and it will require a lot of um, advocacy, a lot of investments and resources. The last point I would make is that many agencies, funds, and programs are involved in supporting with different instruments. So for example, if you're UNICEF, you do the multiple indicator cluster survey. If you're UNFPA, you're supporting the census. If you're UNDP, you're supporting multidimensional poverty measurements. So I think part of the challenge and one of the things that the national focal points for the ABAS can help do is bring the system together, working with the coordination office so that various inputs and technical capacities that reside across the UN system can be collated and can be linked to your schedules in terms of the various um, surveys and so on that need to be done so that we can hopefully jointly mobilize the resources and so that we can also um, advocate for the government so that they can make the investments necessary for closing some of the data gaps. So I'll leave it there. Um, but certainly um, glass half full um, situation. Thank you very much, Bob Pips. Very quickly. Uh, thank you, moderator, and uh, thank you as well to the panelists for that really informative session. I just thought I'd also provide some um, some lesson learned from the Pacific as well in terms of statistics and data as well as the statistical governance mechanism that currently exists in the Pacific, um, which is led by our sister crop agency, SPC. Uh, and we were so fortunate uh, last week to be hosted by the government of Vanuatu uh, through the, the Vanuatu Bureau of Statistics, uh, where we held the, the weekly Pacific uh, Statistic Governance Meeting. Um, so we had a number of meetings within that week uh, and a number of groupings that met, uh, particularly the Specific Statistics Standing Committee that oversees the implementation of the Pacific Statistics Strategy, uh, as well as the Sp Statistics Pacific Statistics Methods Board that uh, looks at the technical proposals of methodology collection, um, and as well as the donor and development partner group, uh, which consists of partners within the region, including the UN, that supports uh, statistics within the region. Um, and a lot of the discussions that we had last week really focused around what is being discussed now in terms of capacity. Um, the Pacific Statistics Standing Committee endorsed last week their strategic framework to for capacity building within the region uh, and that is a 10-year plan uh, that we are using to help build the national statistics offices uh, across the region um, 
in terms of the donor development partner group we also met uh, to discuss some of the issues around how we can better support um, the national statistics office offices um, as well as how we can better coordinate resourcing um, uh, within the region uh, so this donor and development partner group uh, regularly meets uh, to provide updates on how we are supporting the member states in building their capacity and providing that uh, assistance towards the 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 national statistics office um so i thought i'd i'd also provide that example from the from the pacific region um and in terms of the existing mechanisms that we have to support data and statistics and uh, collection within the region Naka. thank you i'd like to um, give a chance to Ms. tishka francis to just respond to some of the comments final comments of the day thank you Thank you, Juliet. Um, yeah, just to respond, thank you to the questions from. Hello, yes, from Mauritius around um, uh, the evalu evaluation, monitoring and evaluation framework and who it will cover. Um, while the whole ABUS will inform the development of the I of the M and E framework. Um, the m and &E framework will focus mainly on uh, how, the chapter on how do SIDS get there. And that covers not only um, the SIDS responsibilities for their own sustainable development, but the international community's commitments. So we should have um, some coverage of how the partners have been um, supporting the implementation and the, the achievements and the progress we've made along those lines included in the framework um, and in the outputs of the framework. Um, and with respect to um, capacity development, we ours also calls for um, uh, DESA and OHRLLS to have workshops to familiarize it with the application of the framework and to build capacity to collect and submit data around the framework. Um, we will have to discuss within the IATF the timing of those workshops and to see how best we can um, uh, support the SIDS in in particular in um, being able to develop the um, uh, capacities around the collection and submission of the data. Um, so that will be something we'll definitely consider and we'll we'll keep you abreast of, of related developments. Thank you. Thank you, Tishka. And um, I'd like to thank all of our um, panel contributors today, including those of you that are online. Um, thank you very much for your valuable contributions. I think we've all had a really good discussion this afternoon on looking at some of the best practices of localizing the ABBAs, but also looking back on where we've come and how we're going to use that integrated into our new framework. And this brings us to the end of session two and um, the end of Monday. So thank you everybody for your patience and your um, I'll give it back to our lovely MC. Thank you. That's the loudest clap you've had, you've made all day. And I can really understand why. But um, thank you very much for, uh, uh, for making uh, this day. Uh, Sorry, so I, I apologize again for the glitches we had this morning. I, I think uh, we made a few changes with our technology and then somehow um, it uh, we pulled through. Um, but uh, thank you for your patience and uh, hopefully tomorrow it'll hold, the technology will hold. But um, thank you very much for uh, the, your patience and for making this day, uh, you know, one where we have rich discussions on the, the first two sessions. Um, Tomorrow, we will have session three, session four, and then a wrap up in the afternoon. But um, before um, we disperse uh, for your to your respective hotels, uh, as I said, the Vanuatu government will be hosting you for a welcome cocktail. We'll head down to where we had lunch today by the beach, and then we can have um, 
uh, you can indulge in Vanuatu uh, beer, um, uh, Australian wine, and New Zealand um, uh, <laughs> white wine, <laughs> um, and um, and of course Vanuatu cover. And then um, our songbird is just setting up now, and so um, we will have uh, a few drinks until our DG arrives, who will deliver uh, one and a half uh, minute, minutes of um, uh, remarks, of welcome remarks, and then we can enjoy the evening until we disperse at around 7.30. So please uh, relax and then come and enjoy Vanuatu hospitality. Thank you.